YouTube. The time has come to upgrade from this to this beautiful little dainty creature. Sport Cub S UMX, about five years ago, ish today, I was learning to fly radio control airplanes with this, with SAFE, okay? Today, I'm gonna to be bringing this to you. This could easily be a first plane for somebody that has lots of money and lots of room, but I recommend this instead. It's a lot less money for a first plane. But today, we're gonna to be flying this. Um, okay, radio's on, throttle cuts on. The safe, um, they have an off switch on the inside of this, is turned off. We have our adapter, which we're gonna show you how to build at the end of this video. It's the most tedious, boring part of the video. And then the IC5, so this is EC3. This is HXT4. We're gonna plug this in. It will not initiate the safe. Okay, that's a 6S 4000 milliamp. Um, okay, now we're gonna let safe initiate. I'm controlling the plane just in case something would go wrong. It shouldn't. I turned the switch on, and so now that's gonna allow the receiver to initiate. Okay, so the, the dance and then the, the song tells you that it's ready. Okay, the reason I'm showing you this stuff is because it's all helpful with a big plane. It's awkward to move this plane. I did add this little tab here, and yes, there will be an unboxing, build, and then radio setup, as well as building those connectors. I believe the next part of this video will be radio setup though. So let's show it going through a door because this plane is big. Holy crap, this door is big too, and we're gonna make it by the skin of our teeth. This plane is 84 inches long, okay? Do you want me to grab your radio? Yeah, camera crew. It did go through, and you could go this way too. So <clears throat> I didn't want to do a maiden on a day where the weather was anything less than stellar. And I would say that right now, the weather is not stellar, but it's not bad either. And it should film good. So elevator up, elevator down, rudder left, rudder right, aileron on roll, aileron on roll, flaps, flaps. Okay, so take off flaps engage, throttle cuts off. We're gonna taxi out. You would not have to be on a runway with this plane, I can tell you that right now. Those tundra tires are big. The wind is coming from my left to right. And it's very... Hey, can we pause for a second? Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, so we're going to take off. There's just kind of confused winds. Um, me and Megan, I'm excuse me, the camera crew, are going to be filming from this point, which is typical. This thing should get off the ground in just a few feet. But we're going to take off from the runway. <laughs> See how much throw we've got on that. Very good ground handling. I love it so far. Everything was lined up mechanically straight right off the bat, something I expect from Horizon. <laughs> Holy crap, that thing gets off the <laughs> ground fast. That's about 30% throttle. Little touchy. I feel like it needs a little more expo, which I will be adding. Wow, that thing is good. Feels like it's flying a little bit nose heavy. Thing has power. landing flaps let's see it slow down <laughs> stops up there okay out of the full landing flaps into the power look at that runner authority guys full landing flaps let's bring it in for a nice relaxed into the wind touchdown that was full up elevator and full landing flaps as you can see Taking off again. Boy, that thing is, it's got some pitch insensitivity that I didn't expect, or excuse me, some pitch over sensitivity that I didn't expect on a big plane. That's full throttle. Let's go over here into this uh, quadrant. The 6S just chirps at me because I was riding it hard. 
Takeoff flaps engaged. Come all the way out here. You know, the Horizon video on this thing shows them doing all sorts of crazy stuff. But really, I like looking at scale flyers. Under the uh, powwow lines, which isn't really a new trick if you've seen my channel. <laughs> it's more of a necessity. Riding the elevator on the downhill sweep. Out of the throttle all together, full landing flaps. Let's see it slow down coming downhill. We'll just do a nice slow flight. We've got a little bit of wind at our face. Getting into the throttle a little bit as I come out of the takeoff or into the takeoff flaps. Full throttle, bring it over the tree line and back around. Take off flaps to help with the uh, droop I was noticing. With the wind, full throttle before the trees hit and stall turn or wing over. Full landing flaps into the very light wind, maybe three miles an hour. Okay, now we'll show you some some action from the tire or from the grass. Okay, full landing flaps. I need more elevator authority on takeoff so that I don't feel like I'm maxed out, although I was maxed out there, just so you guys know. There is another hole in that control horn. Okay, let's show them safe. Let's get up to altitude and turn it on here. They're safe. 50% throttle, giving it a, a roll to the left. Ready, hon? Mm -hmm. See both, so yep. witnessing. Take off flaps on for extra lift for slow flight performance. A little bit of roll input, a little bit of roll input. You'll notice it straightens the plane right out. Safe is good. I'm at my warning for time. Out of safe now. What was that? It sounded like a cannon. <laughs> Did you hear it? Yeah. It probably was a cannon. Where are you landing? Regular spot. Okay. okay, take off flaps, landing flaps. This is where I want more elevator authority, guys. Because look where the elevator is. That thing could be pointed straight up as far as I'm concerned on a plane like this. Okay, initial thoughts. That is the type of flight horizon I expected on the EC-1500. Now, I didn't get it, but I do have it dialed in and it's flying good. Not like that. This flies good. That flies okay. There is totally a cannon going off back there. I don't know what's going on. Let's let's take a quick look at one thing. Now, probably what we'll do is we'll see if we can get some clear weather. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna throttle cuts on. I turn my expo all the way down, which means I all the way switch all the way down, which means I need to turn that up um, because there's just see it's five, then ten, then fifteen. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the, my middle setting and I'm gonna set this to like 20. I'm gonna set the high setting to like 40 and I'm gonna leave my low setting. I'm actually gonna put it to zero. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna give me my crazy setting, okay? For like if I'm trying to do 3D maneuvers. Need a lot more expo on the elevator. And this is a preference thing, guys, but I'm just telling you how I do it. This is the way I do it. I usually try to do double and half, but on this, the elevator, I know I need a little bit more. Um, so on zero, I'm gonna go like that. I'm gonna go 15 up to 25. Excuse me, I did that wrong, guys. This one's supposed to be zero. That's my lowest setting. And then I'm gonna make the middle setting, I'm gonna go, let's do 20. And then on the highest setting, we'll do like 30, okay? So we have a nice linear approach to it. Remember, on the Maiden, you fly, and then what you do is you adjust your settings, your, your core settings. And then if you get a super windy day, you may wanna go up a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on what you're doing with it. And then like if you're trying to do 3D stuff, you can bring that expo down to almost nothing. And I always start out making sure my controls are in the neutral position, so that's the way I use, I use F for uh, dual rates and expo. I generally don't drop the rates down, but I did on my highest setting, just in case it's kind of wonky and you want to try to do something about it. Okay, we're going to try one more takeoff to see how it feels in the middle setting. Wind's coming sort of from this direction, guys. Okay, it's coming from this direction, so we're going to try to spin it around quick. 
We did have our four minute warning, but this is a 6,000 milliamp pack, excuse me, a 4,000 milliamp pack. We'll be trying this with a 6,000 milliamp pack and we'll be trying it with uh, two 3,000 milliamp 3S in parallel to show you that it can do it. And it also flies on 4S and I have a 5S pack I wanna to try too, so. Oh, gorgeous. Feels way more consistent, easier to fly with the better expo. Looks more real, a little bit more tame, but I love it. Full landing flaps. Oh, let's do a grass landing. And boy, that thing pitches up under throttle. It's amazing how much it pitches up with the with the burst of throttle. Is that a 15.7 or a 15.6, hon? I can't remember. Ah, uh, 15.7, I think. 15.7? This thing could stand to have just a little bit more juiciness at the low end and a little bit bigger prop. Okay, we didn't show you a close up of takeoff. Let's try for almost like stole like takeoff here, okay? Yep, she'll get up. Now, the other thing I wanna do, no beep yet, let's do it from the grass. You wanna film from the other direction, please? Right there, perfect. And what I'm going to do is I'll land on the regular grass right before the bug, right before the bug thing. Okay, or after the bug thing. <laughs> Let's try a grass takeoff from better quality grass. That was kind of like weedy grass, guys. We're going to go into the wind as we should, so I'm back taxiing. Ready? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna take off from a total standstill. We'll do stole style takeoff here. Okay, in the grass, no throttle. Pull up elevator, here we go. Out of the throttle to relax the battery so it doesn't blow up in there. Man, you can kick that thing around like crazy, like it's nothing. That zero throttle, lots of prop tractoring. Full landing flaps, my neighbors are probably wondering what the heck is going on. Is that guy flying a real plane today? And I would say it feels like it and I love it. And that thing is gorgeous. Is that not gorgeous, camera crew? Yeah. Look at that articulating cool. landing gear, man. It's just so good and so much rudder authority. Guys, these are all the things that you want in a plane. Why do you not have one? Probably for the same reason I didn't have one. And that is it's $440. So to be honest with you guys, if you get a plane and it's good and it's big and it's got good features and it's well executed, $440 is a good value. You still got to have this crap. And if you're buying that for your first plane, give me a break. You got too much money to blow on RC. Um, you should get better habits like having a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know some of you guys do. Um, I'm also married. I don't know if you guys noticed it. My camera crew is my wife. So, oh, it's out the bag now. So here we go. No one knew. One more takeoff. I'm at uh, six minutes past my four minute timer, just so you guys know. Nice, smooth, slow takeoff. 20% power. Get it down, Brian. Full throttle. Full landing flaps. A lot of pitch authority, guys. I just cannot believe how much pitch authority I have. And the funny thing is, I was complaining about pitch authority earlier because of the nature of my landing, that's the only place where I really wanna have more pitch authority is when I come in for landing, I wanna be able to carry that nose into the stall. Okay, there you have it. I wanna keep flying, but guys, I have places to be and people to see, and it's not you guys today, it's somebody else. But this thing is awesome. If you seriously wanna help support the channel, guys, two things, watch the video, I don't care if you like it. You can like it if you want. I appreciate it if you do. But really, buy the stuff from the links below. It helps fund some of my extravagant spending on things I don't need. Um, and when I say extravagant, I say that very facetiously because $50 in a month is definitely not going to help with the extravagance. Um, but it will help with the batteries that come out of your airplane and go like this. <laughs> not going to admit to anything happening like that. But just saying, be careful out there. Enjoy the video. Give me a like if you like it. This thing is beautiful. We'll be doing some more videos with different battery packs. We'll probably do one that's called Cub and Z Cub Battery Options or something like that.
Come back for more. The build will follow, as well as the unboxing and the battery connectors. Thanks for watching, guys. YouTube, it's Brian Phillips coming back with an, another video. Five years ago, this is what was tripping my trigger. This is a pretty cool plane, and it's very awesome if you're just getting into it. But when I started flying um, this carbon, carbon cub, the Omax, this beautiful little plane was my plane. And I literally flew seven motors out of this thing before I tried to upgrade it to a, a brushless motor. And uh, so this little thing, this ready to fly plane, I think I might have got a bind and fly, but either way, this is a, this is something that you can do if you want to. Today, we are going to be breaking open a new box, a very exciting box that's slightly bigger. I don't know what it is yet, except that I do, but it's bigger than this, and I'm excited. But I just wanted to show you guys that because when I unbox this thing, it's got a special meaning to us because my wife told me that when we got our property in the farm or whatever you want to call it, the country dwelling, that I could get this thing. And so we have been here for long enough that I should have already had it, but I'm just getting it. It's been like a whole five months. Five months. And there's other promises that have been made about this property. <laughs> that we're, we're trying to there are. make come true for both of Wait, us. Oh. You may have already read the box, but if you haven't already read the box, this is the unboxing of the Carbon Z Cub. The plane I've been lusting after for many, 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 many moons. Thank you, Dan Fruit. And so many moons, in fact, <laughs> that they discontinued So gorgeous. Look at those gorgeous vortex generators. So guys, this this is it. The Carbon Z Cub SS 2.1 meter. It's the new and improved version. It's got a different wing tip on it. And uh, to be honest with you, I kind of hope to get the blue and white one because I love that color scheme. But this one's a better plane and it's better for a variety of reasons. Horizon Hobby not only updated the price by charging more, but they also upgraded the plane. Unlike the Carbon ZT28 that they just jacked the price by $150 because it's a big box. Thanks, you're welcome Horizon for mentioning that. Um, I'll get one of those when you lower the price back to what it should be. <laughs> But this thing is going to be awesome and I can't wait to fly it. Ugh. It's so huge that like, you can't reach both sides. The camera crew is going to have to help. Hold on. Okay, camera crew. Wait, I got to make sure I'm on. This plane is equipped with AS3X, and, which is the basis of safe technology. AS3X, as you all know by now, if you watch my channel, is artificial three axis stabilization which is the heartbeat of SAFE, which is the sensor-aided flight envelope. That's what those things stand for, if you didn't already know. One is auto-leveling, the SAFE is auto-leveling, and then AS3X is stabilization. When pushes the wing down, ailerons work to resist. That's a basic example of what it does. And uh, so far, so good. Box is, you know, to be expected, Horizon Hobby style, very nicely packed box so far. And uh, very, very big. It's a single stack box, which is sort of surprising. We got a little bit of damage here. If you want to look, not on the product itself, but there's some damage. Some foam broke out. So we'll be keeping an eye out to see if maybe something got broke in shipping. I kind of doubt it. It looks like a plug of some sort. Uh, looks like they came with some, uh, hold on, I guess it's a knife. It came with some advertisements here um, for, uh, for Horizon, yeah. So, yeah, so they want me to advertise for them. Not like I'm not already doing that. And uh, let's just try to pull these pieces out. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the pieces out 
You've probably seen this video in reverse order. I'm thinking of doing it like I did the EC1500 uh, twin, which I did just a few weeks ago. Uh, check the end screens if you want to watch that, or you can go to my playlist. Guys, if you haven't figured this out, I have a playlist for hundreds of, well, not hundreds of planes, but lots of planes. Lots. Almost. Yes, man, that is a gorgeous wing. Wow. That's big. That's huge. I know. Where is this going? Yeah, it's going uh, evidently in the outside. <laughs> big digital servos here, it looks like. This is a 26 gram digital servo. And this is a 13 gram sub micro servo. I'm not exactly sure if that's a digital servo, but you'll notice the wingtips have this swoop here. I forget what they call that. Uh, it helps with low speed stability. And you'll notice on the, the older variety, obviously this is smaller, but they had the same exact wingtip style. Uh, you had this rounded cub style, cub crafters, carbon cub wing. And then they went to this design, which this would be an upgrade in real life too. Okay, so we're gonna keep moving. Uh, these tape things always get me screwed up when I'm unboxing. Really well packed, as usual, from Horizon. Um, this is supposed to be a good flying plane. I suspect it will be. My emotional bank with Horizon Hobby was drained out on the last one because I thought it was going to be awesome. I thought it was going to be the best thing since sliced bread, and I just didn't think it was. Um, that would be the EC1500 cool plane. I ended up getting it flying good, um, but only after a lot of effort. Something I expect from Hobby King, not Horizon Hobby. Uh, so a little bit disappointed in the last plane, hoping this isn't a repeat because this is another $400 plus dollar plane. Um, for the size, I think it's a reasonable price. Uh, it could stand to be a little bit cheaper, but still, it is a very big plane. And so when you get a big plane, then you sort of expect a big price point. Now, keep in mind, guys, there is a fuse between here. The fuse, the wing on the top is integral to the fuse, so it's actually more like this. So that's a big wingspan. This will not be the biggest, but it will be one of the biggest planes that I have. And uh, while there are other giant scale planes out there, this one is pretty big, especially for a binding fly plane. So it's something that you can pull out of the box, have put together in an evening, and when I say an evening, I mean an evening for me. I mean for you guys, you probably do it in the field before you go flying. Beautiful. It's wonderful. Look at this. Look at this. Carbon fiber in there, guys. This is going to be a well-designed plane. I can already tell. Everything is very light. Very light. Beautiful. This is a hollow core design, if I recall. Let's show the people at home. I don't know for a fact yet. I believe it is because it's very light. Yes, hollow core, guys. Mm -hmm. You see that? This wing is much lighter than it should be, okay? You would think with a cord that big, it would be just gargantuan, and it should be, except this is hollow. So what you get is a very strong wing, uh, internal structure, drawback you get with that is that when you do have a, a, a crash, you're less likely to walk away with a one piece wing and more likely to walk away with two or three pieces. So keep that in mind when you're flying this plane. All of they're supposed to be very resilient. Standard Z foam, but look at this. The finish is so smooth now. And until you have this sitting out in the sun, it's gonna stay that way. I don't know if they can see that. Very smooth finish. This plane, it's not like an ultra scale plane. It's not a bad scale plane. It's just that you don't have glass windows. You don't have a, a pilot. You don't have seats and things of this nature. Um, you can get the Kano 9 plane if you want that. Um, but you are going to spend a significantly more on that plane. It's about $350 price point plus all the goodies. If you figure on about a third of the price, uh, between a third and a half on an ARF, and then the other half, of course, is the components, the motor, the servos, all that good stuff. An almost ready to fly is probably the stupidest terminology I've ever heard in a hobby. Uh, but almost ready to fly is kind of like saying, you know, this phone case is almost ready to fly. You know, you have a lot of work. Granted, you know, that terminology was developed back in the day when you used to have to put together, put together a balsa wood uh, kit and like talking from plans all the way to finish, you might have a couple months in a project or weeks or whatever it is, depending on how motivated you were. 
When I was a kid, it took me months to build this sort of thing. Of course, I wasn't building planes like this. I was building planes that I wish I could fly. And they were just, you know, for looks and gliders and things like this. In fact, I still have some of them, and it's pretty cool. Gosh, they take everything in. It's no really kidding. annoying right now. Okay, so here's the prop. That thing is a little bit bigger than the original. Carbon fiber rod for, I believe, the tail. Look at this thing. That's a big one. 15 mm. 7. Jeez. Okay, let's juxtapose that to the original <laughs> UMX, which stands for Ultra Micro for all of you. This does have safe, but it is full safe. This is safe select. Yeah, that's a little bit bigger, guys. Slightly. Almost the length of the wing. That is the length of the fuselage, which is pretty cool. Uh, one thing I noticed in even Horizon's video of this plane, the prop was either way out of balance or it made a lot of noise. So I'm trying to figure out if I'm gonna have the same problem. Maybe they rushed it, they filmed the video in the rain, so I'm not really sure what the deal was with that. Give him a shot of this. They have reinforced the packaging with this thicker packing tape, the reinforced packing tape. So they mm -hmm. must have had some problems with this packaging, guys. My guess is what's happened is they upgraded the landing gear by the way, and that is one of the principal reasons why I was not annoyed that I got this versus the old one, because the old one had crappy landing gear, and anybody who had the Carbon Z Cub, uh, you could get online and you could spend like 400 or 500 bucks on replacement landing gear. Holy cow. Yeah, exactly. My wife is glad now that I got this. Check <laughs> this out. Welded together. Steel, guys. This is not aluminum. It is steel. Okay. So, they reinforced the packaging, must have had some problems there. Uh, maybe they had some complaints or something. It does look like these things really beat around in there, and that might be part of it because they used the original mold for this thing here. So here's our wheels that will splay out to either side. Obviously, we're not gonna build this right this second, but we will have a video showing it. One of the original complaints, hard foam tires. Camera crew, squish that. Is that hard? Oh. Mm -mm. Not as hard as I thought. Yeah. That could be awkward. So, but they still don't squish very much. It's definitely not a pneumatic tire. Okay, guys? You, this plane is big enough. It's capable enough. You can put a pneumatic tire on there if you wish. But I do love that it's got a ton of tire. So, some things we might do on this video, which will be pretty cool, is obviously if you've been watching my channel for any length of time, oh, that is gorgeous. Very smooth action. And there's no bearings. It's just plastic on steel. Of course, how can you go wrong? So, um, here's the rest of the hardware to put together the spring. Look at the springs, geez, guys, that's huge. I love it. This huge spring, that should hold up to a few rough landings. I'm excited to uh, share those with you. <laughs> Hopefully they're not too rough. So we're just gonna keep cutting stuff out, guys. This is the unboxing part. Like I said, you might be watching this out of order. You may have already seen the Maiden. You may have seen me jumping for joy about how awesome this thing is. You may have seen me really pissed off because I just crashed it. But this plane will live in infamy in this stage because YouTube will sing it for me. Oh my goodness, I, I can't quite get that stuff out. I have to put the motor in. Are you kidding? You know why you have to put a motor in? No, seriously, camera crew. Do I know this is, why? This is serious. I have to install the motor. Because it won't fit in the box. Because they can't ram it in the box. They should try harder. I know. That's what I say all the time. Um, instruction manual. Guys, usually this is just like throw it straight in the garbage. Except that Verizon Hobby, thumbs up Verizon. Most of the time, well, 50% of the time or better, your manuals are actually really good. And then the other 49% of the time, your manuals are 90% better than the rest of the industry. And I don't say that lightly because I don't have to read Chinglish to read your manuals. I appreciate that. Thank you for having an English speaking representative write your manual about the Chinese made plane. <laughs> Here's the documentation. That thing is like a book. Jeez, no look at that. That's huge. Huge. Great. You know why it's huge? Check this out. Check this out. Look. Because it's Italian. We've got the Italian. We've got the Italian. We've got the French. Let's read it in French. We have the Dutch. We have the Dutch. We have the English. So, just so you know, when you see this book, don't be scared. Don't run away. 
You can do it. You can do it. It's in English. All right. The calendar. Guys, I'm kind of trying to do this in some order. Okay. This is made of foam. Horizon, if you're listening, I know you're not. This would be a good thing to have made out of plastic if you ask my opinion. Yeah. However, I understand why you did that and I forgive you already, okay? Because you want to sell another one. These are good things to do to stay in business, just saying. Towerhead! Anyway, <laughs> sure there's some people that love tower hobbies out there. I try to just piss them off. That's, that's okay. They're out of business. That's all I'm going to say. So, that being said, there's been a lot of talk about this carbon ZT28 that just got re-released. My goodness, look at this carbon fiber rod. Where's the broom? That's, Where's the broom that goes that's with this thing? That's ridiculous. That's Anyways, here, crazy. Here, hold on, feel it. You got to feel the light in it. Holy cow. That's incredible. That's amazing. This utility knife weighs probably three times yeah. as much. It's, that is incredible. And really cool. It is hollow, folks. Um, you, you don't want to lick these things, from what I understand. <laughs> was that a question? No, no it, was, it was questioning it all the time. <clears throat> so this is going to be the joiner between the main wings. Um, it's got a little bit of flex to it. Carbon fiber will flex, despite what you've read. Oh, I'm excited to see it. I can't wait for its emergence. Oh, it's so glorious. I would have preferred the Hanger 9 version that's gold and silver, but you know what? This will do. Okay, I thought that was going to be like reddish orange. It's like orange orange. This is orange. It is orange. Orange orange. Orange, orange. orange glad. Okay, no, no. I'm not going to <laughs> So, again, a few things that didn't get upgraded. Um, this little area around here, that's the paint is going to chip from what I understand. Oh, that's always nice when that doesn't open. Might make it a little bit hard to get the, the canopy out because that is how you open the canopy. Um, I'll have to do a little investigative research to figure out why that doesn't open. My hope is that I don't have to get another fuselage to uh, get that open. That would suck, but I guess then I would have a spare. But don't tell her. I'm not wearing a power bike. Sorry. <laughs> I've had a few people ask me to do that. A few? A few. I'm not going to do it. I refuse. Too much work. Ooh, look at that. Oh, that is a gorgeous tail. Ooh. Are you kidding me? I got to glue the tail on? What? Wouldn't fit in the box. Look at this. CA joint. Are you kidding? Really, Horizon? What? Serious law? Look at that. It's a CA joint. Give them a close look. They will work, but seriously, really? See a joint? Seriously. I'm sorry. It is what it is, guys. You can only do so much for $450. Multiplied by the uh, labor rate differential between here and China of 400 times. <laughs> okay, so inside this giant bag, because there's lots of pieces in here, I'm gonna open it. Oh yeah, baby. We got Vortex Generators. Oh. It's, it's the real deal. It's the real McCoy Vortex Generators. They don't look very sharp. I'm not sure what they were going for with the not sharp Vortex Generators. Maybe somebody cut their kid with one of the old Vortex Generators. I know they were about like this, but uh, normally I see Vortex Generators. I want to have a sharp edge, but I don't know. Maybe it was easier in the cartoon printout. Look at this stick. Look what at is this. That? Wing oh. struts. Don't break it. Hmm. Yeah, it feels like maybe it's got a little bit of flex to it, but did you hear the poppy pop mm -hmm. pop? Yes. Hmm. That's interesting. It's no problem. We'll just let the wing rip off. So we've got those. They look like they're a reasonable quality build. Okay. This is the other. Doesn't look like it's going to do much in terms of lateral strength. It's just going to be pulling strength. Because remember, all these things do, guys, is they take the lift that's made out here on the end of the wing and it pulls to the bottom of the fuse, which lifts up the plane. It's fun. That way you have less load on the wing. So very low wing loading on this plane. Uh-oh, we have a zip tie. 
We have a rogue zip tie. Do you need a thing? No, I don't need a thing. I got a thing. Okay, you ready? Oh yeah, that's whew, it's big. Look at this. It's a BL50. There's your, your EFLM7450. That's, that's a pretty big motor. Mm -hmm. That's a big motor. I like it. That's cool. I'm excited to put that in. And we're gonna come full circle. I've been talking about this a lot. You may be watching this in reverse order, okay? Really? Yes. If you're watching it in reverse order and I've already crashed it, don't tell anybody. Don't ruin it for them. They're also watching it in reverse order. There is nothing on the back side of this package. Correct. So you don't have to be that weirdo looking at the back of it um, at the flying field as you assemble it. You're gonna be a little annoyed if you bring this to the flying field and assemble it because there's a lot of assembly that looks like mm -hmm. this. Look at that. It looks like a graveyard for RC airplanes. Yay. Yeah, I know. My wife is so happy. I mean, <laughs> camera crew is super happy about this because now she gets to film me build it. Uh, the good news is most of the massive pieces are done. I don't have to lay these out on a template and build these things. I'm really gonna be annoyed with you, Horizon, if these things don't line up when I'm all done and I bind this up. I want those control surfaces to be nice and straight as an arrow. Just right there. Because my last plane, I fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. And then the next day I fought it some more and then I ended up with like an idiot. Because the trim was so far off. I didn't like that. The good news is I'm not gonna do that again. Because <laughs> I try to learn from my mistakes unless you just it. <laughs> so that concludes the unboxing, guys. Look at this thing. Look at this thing, guys. I just one more shot. One more shot. Look at this little dainty thing. That is pretty cool. So, day one, <clears throat> year five. Day one, year five. I'm just saying, if you're gonna get into it, just remember, one day, <laughs> This is what happens. This is, this is what happens. I had a neighbor. I had a neighbor. Climbed in the neighborhood. I know all the MA, all that. The neighbor was like, you realize, Brian, small planes now, big planes later. And this guy had no freaking clue what he was talking about, except that he was exactly right. <laughs> so, after some counseling, I'm getting better. Mm, no. I'm going to the wrong counseling. Yes. So, with that, we're gonna pause this video, and when I say pause, we're gonna totally stop it and come back with the build part, which is gonna be really, it's gonna be really exciting. Thanks for watching. YouTube, we're back with the Carbon Z Cub SS 2.1 meter, and we're gonna do the radio setup, which seems to be one of the areas where people seem to watch and have questions. So I'm just gonna show you how I do it. Um, just understand that when you set up a plane, there's two things I'm going to give you as a disclaimer. One, if you put a prop on like this and you have a problem, just be careful because that's like one of the few places where people get hurt. And the other thing is with batteries. Batteries are the other thing where people get hurt or property gets damaged. So just be careful with both of those things. Uh, Horizon recommends taking the prop off for liability reasons and uh, that's a huge waste of my time. So anyway, just don't do what you see me do unless you want to take the same risk. This is a bind plug, okay? You have to open up the lid, obviously. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna get access inside here, okay? So now you notice what I just did there, okay, everybody? If this prop starts spinning, it's gonna have enough power to do some damage to itself and to the counter and things like this, but I truly don't suspect that to happen. So I'm not super worried about it. I've never had a problem with one take off like that, but you still wanna take precautionary measures to be able to prevent the plane from moving, okay? So it wouldn't be very fun, but you can definitely do it. Just keep in mind, you gotta remember if that thing's spinning at full thrust, you gotta, you gotta be able to control it. So, or just take it off if you want. The other thing you could do is use extension cords for the batteries if you wanna make one of those, and then you can get in there safely. There is an on off switch in here. Currently it is in the off condition, okay? So just wanna talk about those things real quick. And really all we have to do on this plane is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, we are going to basically pull out the battery tray 
we'll get the battery in there first. We'll kind of see where the CG sits um, as part of like the initial setup. And it is kind of nice to have this set up for uh, like a particular battery you expect to use. But this thing will take a variety of different batteries. So in my case, I'm gonna just start with this 4,000 milliamp 6S um, Turnigy heavy duty 60 through 120C pack. Um, as you can see, I've got the modified um, HXT ends, HXT four millimeter ends, and then I built an, an adapter that takes me down to the EC5 end, which will take me into the IC5 connector that's stuck in the airplane. Normally I replace the ends on the airplanes to XT60, but XT60 is maybe just a hair small for this current load. So I'm gonna go with this to be on the safe side. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my voltmeter that I expect to use during flight. This shouldn't make a big difference on a plane this size because it's just such a small amount of mass compared to the overall mass. But it is nice to kind of have it and know exactly how things are gonna be configured. And then when you get out to the flight line or the field or the front yard or whatever you're, wherever you're flying from, you'll know kind of what's up and you won't have to figure it out. So I'm just gonna strap this in. It's super nice to be able to do this out on a table. Um, that's not always the way it works. I can tell you that from experience. Usually you're kind of like trying to do this while you're bouncing on your, on your fingertips. I'm doing a somersault. Okay, so you get that. Um, I've noticed that this plane does, does tip okay like this, which is good for filming. It's probably a, a little bit hard on the motor, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless you're trying to film this. Um, so obviously we need to have our adapter. Okay. It's got the adapter built. And then we want to have the vine plug plugged in. Now, because of safe select, we have to do this a certain way. I'm going to show you how to initiate safe select. Now, keep in mind, you need that to be uh, in the neutral position on the wheels. Wheels down on the ground when it's ready to be bound. You also want to make sure your throttle is down. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, I'm just kind of setting this up in the order I would normally do it. Um, you wanna get your page turned open, and then what we can do next is we can go ahead and make our radio program, and then we'll bind it, at which point we'll go ahead and fine tune our adjustments at that point. So the quick start information is on one page, it's page three in the English, and then page four is kind of the flap settings and the special settings and things like this, okay? So this is what we're gonna be concentrating on today. But then later on in the manual, like in a completely different spot, they talk about, whoops, I'm in the Dutch. They talk about the safe select. So the reason I'm showing this, safe select switch designation will do actually after a while. That is channel five through channel nine, okay? You're probably thinking to yourself, well, I thought that was a six channel radio. Well, evidently you thought wrong. So, me too. Um, anyway, so, Transmit and receiver binding, enabling and disabling safe select, okay? Horizon, if you're listening, which I know you're not, put that crap all together, okay? Anyway, so that's where it needs to be. So we're gonna stick the plug in, we're gonna put it in bind mode, and then we're gonna remove the bind plug, and then we're gonna press the bind switch on our radio transmitter um, while powering it on, which is going to bind to the aircraft, okay? So anyway, that's the order we're gonna do it in. Just be aware. So we don't actually need to have this in the aircraft yet, but just for the sake of not having this thing right up in my business, I'm gonna go ahead and slide it in quick, and I am not gonna plug in the battery yet. So the way you can do that, it's probably not gonna be super duper easy like this because it's supposed to drop down, so I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do this, and my camera crew's gonna probably have to reposition and look over my shoulder or something. You push it in, and then you slide it back a little bit, and then you snap down the one, the one lever. And that keeps it from slipping the, the actual holder. It doesn't necessarily stop the battery from slipping. The Velcro does that, okay? So in this case, I would be ready to plug this in at my leisure, which I'm not gonna do. I'm just gonna leave the plug out of the way for now, thus mitigating the risk of draining the, the battery and then also having the prop issue. Okay, so the first step, we're gonna create a new model. Now that we know this page, I can probably go ahead and mark it with a canopy. Then we'll go all the way back here. 
And this is where people ask, how do you do this? Well, just watch the video, okay? Click, scroll all the way down to system setup. You wanna disable the, the RF, that's the RF light. Watch what happens. It disables the RF and then it allows you into the menu structure so you can make changes. We're gonna to go to model utilities. We're gonna create a new model. Do you wanna create a new model? Yes, I do. Why do I wanna create a new model? Because it's a new plane and I don't have it created yet, okay? First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this little page. It says, transmitter setup, blank acro model, wing type, one, aileron, one flap. I'm gonna sit down for ease of my camera crews filming over my shoulder. So, at this point you're gonna go into Aircraft type, and you're gonna validate that you have one aileron and one flap, like that. And then you're gonna to click to accept. The tail is normal. Now, there is, just as a heads up, guys, I'm gonna just mention this, I'm not gonna do this. If you wanna do the advanced setup, do all this crap, and then you're gonna go back in, and you're gonna do the optional bind and fly advanced receiver setup which is found on page 18 of the manual. And it shows you all the setup for the different things you need to do in removing the factory setup for the flap and then separating them and then treating those as uh, flap runs or spoiler runs, if you will, okay? They will also act as flaps when certain switches are engaged. I have not gone through it because I really don't care. I don't think I'm gonna need that. If I decide to do that, I'll share it with you, okay? Uh, that being said, these manuals are valuable. You don't get good manuals like this on cheap planes, so you might as well take advantage of what you can um, because it does make it a lot easier. So anyway, the fact that I'm going through this is just still kind of baffles my mind because why don't you just read it yourself is kind of what I'm saying without saying it. <laughs> so I'm going to go next, and then it's got a picture, and I like to change the picture so that it better represents the plane that I'm building a model for because it does actually truly help. Later when you have a ton of little planes, you have a quick, you can quickly look at that icon. Now, you could do all this while you're in the menu, but I found it just as easy to basically back out, make sure that it exists as an acro. Okay, so then the first thing I do is I set up a throttle cut. I'm gonna turn it on and I'm gonna assign it to this switch. That's what I always use, switch H. Horizon recommends 130. I am going to set, I'm gonna set that to Negative 100, I do not know why it's negative 130 by default. That seems kind of crazy to me. It can cause other problems, which I won't go into now. I've done it before in the past. Okay, so throttle cuts off, throttle cuts on. You can tell because the throttle moves and it's allowed to move. And now it goes to zero or minus 100 in this case. This is minus 100, that's plus 100. Typical setup. You can set these up to be plus or minus 150%, just so you know, if you don't already know that. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go to the uh, timer. I'm gonna change it to one out from one time inhibit. I'm gonna click, I'm gonna say active, and I'm gonna go tone and vibrate. Tone, vibe. So basically, I'm gonna set the clock to four minutes. That's what they recommend. So now I've got a four minute timer that will start when you get the, the throttle up past 25%, and then it's gonna keep running, okay? And then I can shut my throttle cut off you can see, and then you can see that the throttle is working now. So when I throttle cut that, it's down. Now, part of the reason I do that right away is because I want the fail safe to cut the throttle, okay? So fail safe is initiated at the binding process. So what I mean by fail safe is, ultimately, if you're setting up a plane with safe and you're not, you're not taking advantage of the safe within your fail safe, don't get confused, you're crazy because if you have safe turned on, let's say you lose con complete control of your plane because you have a complete radio signal, like somebody shuts your radio controller off, which has happened to people, I'm sure. Just comment below if you have. Um, one of my first experiences with radio controlled airplane, my dad lost a gas airplane because he bumped the power switch on a Futaba radio, an old one. It's like a three channel radio. And back in the day, that was, that was the cat's meow. Total loss. Anyway, nobody got hurt, it was in a cornfield. But just to be clear, if you shut this off and you have your fail safe right, the safe would initiate, it would activate, and it would cut the throttle, and then it would fly level and true. 
hopefully not into some kid's head, but it's possible. So just be aware. I'd rather it fly straight and true as opposed to just doing some wonky, weird behavior, okay? It's at least predictable. You might have time to turn your radio back on and get it back. Seriously. Okay, enough about that. You also notice the timer is going. I'm gonna press clear, that clears it. So now you know how that works, pretty cool. Now I'm gonna click in here, I'm gonna go back to system setup. I'm gonna disconnect RF, the light goes out. I'm gonna to go to model name. I always name my models. Why do I name my models? Because I have a lot of models. I don't wanna to have to wonder about it. My friend Esteban, the, the cameos on my channel, uh, he never takes the time to do this. And so he's like, oh, hey, Brian, which one did we set up? And I'm like, uh, did, did you name it? Oh, no, man, it's an acro. <laughs> and I'm like, what? How many acros do you have? Oh, 13. Okay, anyway, so if you've ever seen Esteban, you'll know exactly what's going on. So carbon Z-Cub SS 2.1 meter. I am going to put this into high speed and pause it, and then when we come back, we'll show you what it looks like. Welcome back, folks. <laughs> so carbon dash Z-Cub SS 2.1 meter. You're probably thinking, why did you put the 2.1 meter? Seriously, Brian, you can't remember that? Yeah, that's like the most important thing because I have several carbon Z-Cubs. Well, I have one carbon Z-Cub and I've flown another carbon Z-Cub and then I have the thing that I was calling a carbon Z-Cub at the beginning of the video, which is extremely foolish because it's a, it's a Sport Cub S, you Max. Can't believe I did that. Super embarrassing, but it's in the can now, so too bad. <laughs> okay, so coming along, uh, just so you know, in the aircraft type, if you do the advanced setup, you do change none of that. You leave it the same, even though you could do it within that setup. They have you do it in mixing. Okay, so now channel assign. You will eventually have to assign a channel for safe select. Now, you'll notice that this is a DX18 and it stops at 10. And you're like, oh, well, it's not 18. Yeah, it's not 18. You're right. Because you have to go to the expansion channels and turn them on. Like, usually people don't use them. Now, why would you want to have them off? Because it's, you can't fit it all on the screen, guys. It's a pain in the butt. So anyway, 18 channels, I've never actually used more than 10 in my life. So, but I have a DX18 and I love it and I'm glad it was one of the best RC investments I've made. So that being said, we're gonna leave everything else the same except we're gonna just check the list. Okay, so it talks about the dual rates, high rates, low rates. I do not do low rates. I do not, I do, not do high rates. I don't do any of that crap. I just set up Expo and I'll show you that. Flap travel, don't give a crap about that. Don't give a crap about that. If you guys wanna get out a measuring tape and try to measure all that junk, you can waste your time on your own time it's just, it's just total waste of time so expo soft center so they're recommending 10 and 5 okay so that I could probably do so what I'll do is I'll go into regular flight mode um, I'll click in I'll go to dual rates and expo so this is a screen for dual rates and expo not differential and expo I used to do that when I was a uh, much younger in this hobby so the first thing I do and I and some of you guys don't do this I do so I basically set it to the same switch which is switch F in my case, okay? I like all of them to be tied to the same switch, and this is why, because I don't wanna to have to be going to six or seven switches for a minor touchy change, okay? I want a massive change, and I want it to be right now, okay? So, from rudder, I'm gonna go Expo. They're recommending five on low and 10. Okay, I tend to like a little bit of rudder, Expo all the time, Plus you'll notice that I put mine on the innermost hole, which means I'm gonna have more output on mine than by standard, okay? And then on the highest expo, meaning the most exponential, then I will have 15 and I'm gonna kick this back to 90. Okay, so that's gonna be a pretty significant change. And if you don't understand what this chart means, what you can do is you can, you can actually move the stick. With a 10% expo, it's a very minimal change in output, okay? So just understand that. Can you go over my right shoulder, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch to elevator. The elevator in the lowest setting is gonna be probably five. Then the middle setting is gonna be like 10. And then the highest setting is gonna be 15 with 90. Now, what am I doing here, guys? This is really simple. I'm basically setting up what they recommended in the high rates in the middle setting. That's where I start flying. If I get in the air and I'm like, this thing is way pitch sensitive, then I can bring it down and then I fix that. When I get on the ground, I change my middle setting to the setting that I had been running on. And then I make the high setting double that and I make the low setting half, unless I'm going for 3D flight. If I go for 3D flight, then I basically have to make another mix in there that's like a negative expo, which you can do. See this? Look, you can make the center even more touchy, okay? I don't recommend it. 
player brings you back to zero, by the way. Okay, so now let's go in and set up our ailerons, which we're gonna set at 10% um, in the middle. On the low setting, we'll go five, and on the high setting, we'll go uh, 15, and then we'll cut this back to 90, okay? Then, okay, so the whole re reason we do that, guys, is so that I can, okay, so when I'm flying along, my first flight, I take off and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's like really hard to control. All I have to do is, first of all, chop throttle, get in the glide, relax, get your trims right, and then you can flip whatever setting you're in, you would go to the higher setting, so you pull it down to yourself. My muscle memory is there, it's very easy to do, I don't have to look at it, I know exactly what I'm doing without looking at it, that's key. If you're not setting up your transmitters the same every time, you're crazy, start doing that, it's very easy. Set them up the same every time. Put the same thing on the same switch all the time, unless you have a technical issue that prevents that from happening. Occasionally, I run into that with safe, okay? Because I don't need safe. And if I have retracts, I use my retracts on this switch, which A, okay? So I'm gonna probably assign safe to this switch because I can get to it without looking. I don't like using these two switches for things because I have to come off of the controls. Now, if you pincer grip, then you're gonna have access to it easy. I don't pincer grip, I use thumbs, okay? So. Switch A, that's gonna be what I assign. So when we get to that point, we'll do that. That all being understood, we're done on all the settings because I'm not setting the actual travels. I'm only gonna set up the directions and the percentages, okay? Once I set that, I'll make sure I'm squared away and then I should be good to go. So that'll be good enough for a maiden flight at least. All right, so the next thing I have to do is I have to, okay, so computerized transmitter setup. Obviously, this is computerized transmitter. It's on page four of the English. Um, okay, so blink, acro, do a model reset. You don't need to do a model reset if you create a new one. That's why I always create a new one. It's easy. Okay, so aileron, elevator, and rudder dual rates to high 100 and low 70 is what they recommend. Like I said, I don't come off of high. If I want more low rate behavior, I just increase the expo because then I never lose the end of stick throw um, except that, as you just saw, on my highest expo, I, I drop back 10%. Okay, that's just like for emergency. Um, and there's generally not emergencies in that order, but let's say that you, you are trying to pull away from hitting a tree. You don't, you don't want to have the, the maximum throw cut back. You just want it to be soft in the middle. Okay. Hmm. So anyway, getting back to the point, servo travel is set to 100% and then throttle cut is set to minus 130. That's because their defaults 130. I disagree with this. I'm setting that to 100. You'll understand later someday when you have a propeller start on you. Um, DX8. Set flap system, choose flap. Okay, so let's do that. So from the regular flight mode, we're gonna scroll down to flap system. We're gonna turn it on, it's inhibited currently. I'm gonna click, I'm gonna set it to switch B. That's what I always use. Um, by the way, I wish I could get a four position switch for this instead of a three, because then I could do some cool things with the fourth position, but um, it's anywhere else. Uh, anyway, let's look at this. So the normal is 0% flap. Okay, so normal meaning the position that I'm neutrally gonna fly with. This all the way back is neutral for me. So you can tell where it is by looking at the screen too. Um, so you're gonna do zero. The middle is gonna be 40 for flap. And that is to the positive. And then position two is gonna be plus 100. Now, one thing about this you're gonna notice. Jeez. Okay, so plus 100. Now what that tells me, what that tells me is that the servo has traveled to minus 100 and plus 100, okay? Right now, we're only using half of the throw. We're going for takeoffs, we're doing 40, and then we're doing 100%, uh, okay? But there's also the other sweep side. So the reason they're doing that is for the advanced acro setup. So what a guy could do if you want more deflection on your flaps is you can actually take and set it to minus 100 and then make that the neutral flat setting at which point then you can redo the control horn so that you can make even more deflection. So, cause I want barn doors on this thing. I want to be able to slow it down like crazy. In fact, if I'm going to do any settings on this plane for advanced, it's going to be for flap rounds and spoiler rounds so I can do crow where the ailerons come up and the flaps go down. And then you can basically bring it in and slow that thing down, going basically downhill. And, and you won't believe me until you see it. If you, you know what I mean if you've already seen crow configuration. So anyway, um, they have an elevator correction of 6% on the takeoff setting, which would be like the middle setting. We call that the takeoff flaps. And then we have a 15% elevator correction 
on the landing setting. And then they wanna do a two second delay. The speed is not normal anymore. We're gonna go two seconds. Two seconds is about what I would normally do. Uh, why do you want two second delay, folks? The two second delay means that it takes, okay, so deployment from negative 100 all the way to positive 100 is two seconds. So from 100 to 100 plus, or from zero to 100 plus or 100 minus would be one second. So you need to keep that in mind. It's not a huge difference. It's to make a huge difference in flight performance. But if you're trying to get four second deployment here, you need to do an eight second delay. So just keep that in mind. Play with this stuff. Make sure you test it if you're not sure before you get up in the air. Because you can't really mess with it when you're in the air unless you've got a helper. And then it's still kind of dangerous, so be careful. Um, that all being understood, um, if you transition too quick, the plane will lunge, guaranteed. So you need to do a little bit of a slow transition because you're changing the whole angle of incidence of the wing. Because you actually take that plane flying in a straight path and you will actually change the angle of incidence because you'll change the wing. So like if this is the nose. And, that, and that's actually a good, good thing when you're flying a real plane because that gets you pointed at the runway with your eyes. You can see it over the hood of the, of the airplane. So, or the cowling. So, uh, a couple of different things. Plus then as you're going downhill, you're not going downhill, you're still flying straight. So you actually kick the tail up and kick the nose down a little bit, depending on if it's an inboard flap, okay? Then you can slow down and you can lower your altitude without picking up speed. So that's what's gonna happen. It's all good things. Plus you reduce the stall speed. Same thing with these. These things reduce your stall speed. So they take turbulent air, and when the air starts separating from the top of the wing, it turbulates, okay? That's a stall. That means your plane falls, okay? It'll be a more vi a violent release off of uh, vortex generators than it will off of uh, just a, a standard wing, okay? You're gonna have a, it kind of depends on vortex generators, but you're gonna have basically a nice laminar flow here and it's gonna keep it there longer. And then at some point it's gonna whip off, almost like a rope ripping away. Okay, hmm. once that happens, your plane falls, okay? You still have an elevator, you still have other flight uh, circumstances that are, that are into play, but that's the big thing. Um, okay, so that, that's basically the normal setup. Now we need to just define what channel we're gonna use for, um, we're gonna use for safe select. So you notice that in flap setup mode, we have this other monitor. So like gear's not being used for anything. So that's channel one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so why not just use five? Let's use five. So I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna scroll down to system setup. I'm gonna go yes. And I'm gonna go to channel assign. I'm just gonna make sure that it's not assigned and it's not turned off. Yeah, gear is already assigned. So we're good to go. So basically, I want it to be in that condition because that's gonna be my fail safe. So when I do my assignment like this, okay, then it's gonna know, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna wiggle one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then it'll work, and it'll dance. I'll show you later. Okay, so power's off on the radio. We have the correct model selected. We're gonna be holding this and turning it on when we're ready to bind. You can also, if you have a programmable uh, radio system, you can also go into the bind uh, menu and you can do the same thing. I wouldn't recommend it though because it's sometimes a little bit hard to tell what the switches are um, because you're kind of still in a menu. So anyway, um, all right, so just to refresh your memory, switching on save select, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna install the bind plug. I'm gonna start the procedure by plugging in the pack. Then I'm gonna remove the bind plug. Then I'm gonna pick this up and do holding this, turning it on, okay? If you do it the other way, the standard way, it's gonna bind without save select. Okay, camera crew, why don't you stay here just in case something goes wrong. I don't want you to get hurt. And there shouldn't be any reason for it to go wrong, but I still want to be on the safe side because I haven't vetted the system. I have ample clearance. I don't have to worry about the prop. I'll be able to get this unplugged. That's the key. So just think about these things ahead of time and you'll be totally fine. You'll notice my hand is in the way, so that's obviously not ideal. There is a power switch in here as well. Okay, so we're off, plugging it in. That was the ESC arming, okay? So now I have to turn on the switch, okay? Listening, the switch is on. So we're in, we're, we got this bind plug here. So I just need to unplug the bind plug. So the bind plug is now unplugged here. Now I'm gonna step back a few steps and give them a shot of this and that at the same time. Those are digital servos humming. 
DSMX, 22 milliseconds telemetry. And the bind is complete. So now you'll listen for the chatter of the AS3X and the dance of the AS3X as the, see the servos? Okay, so this thing would be armed, but I have a throttle cut on and I'm set to minus 100%. That is also the fail safe position, okay? Real quick, I'm just gonna just do a safety check. Throttle cuts off. It's going the right direction, that's important. Throttle cut works. We're testing. As far as I'm concerned, it's safe. Cleared my timer, throttle cut is, is double checked to be on. Now, at this point, we're basically setting things up as we see fit. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is set safe select by doing the channel assignment. Okay, so the channel assignment's right here. So mode one and two transmitters. That's weird. Five times you flip it. Okay, throttle cut is on. See it? See it dance, everybody? So safe select is now activated with this switch. Okay, so throttle cuts on, test it again just to make sure. Now I can flip the plane and put the plane in an upside down attitude in order to test that my safe select is working, okay? I have confidence that this isn't gonna start. Okay, so just listening carefully. This is where you test safe. It's the easiest way to do it, upside down. Okay, so this is my safe select. Trying to write the craft, guys. See, one way it's going this way, trying to bring me level. Go past, it's trying to bring me level, trying to bring me level, trying to bring me level. Gosh, this thing is huge. Trying to bring me level, and we're level. Can you see that from the other side? Go to the other side so you can see the, the, the condition. Okay, so you're in a level and true condition. As I tip, safe is trying to level it. Remember, safe, sensory flight envelope is gonna level the plane. Pitch and roll. If you're upside down, watch what happens when I pass halfway. It tries to find the quickest route to level. See? That's how you tell if safe is on, guys. It's very easy. This plane, it's a little awkward because it's so dang big. Okay, so I am going to normally fly with this switch in this condition. So I need to flip the condition. So watch this. So I'm gonna go into servo setup, and I also notice that the flaps are in the opposite condition from what I want too, okay? So I'm gonna go to travel. First of all, I'm gonna go to travel, I'm gonna go to flaps. Watch what happens. See how it's up higher? Now I cleared that, okay? So I'm gonna go to travel, sub trims and reverse. So I wanna reverse gear. That puts safe so that safe is on in this condition when I, I normally wouldn't have safe on. So now safe is off, okay? And then on flaps, I don't wanna reverse, yeah, I wanna reverse flaps, okay? Okay? So I think they must add a manual that had some errors in it. Cause you remember what I was explaining to the people about that? Mm -hmm. Looks like they had that maybe wrong possibly. That's kind of weird. Did I miss it maybe? Okay, so that's pretty good deployment. So now watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go into flap system. See how it says zero? Watch this. I'm gonna go minus 100 to get it level. They must have screwed something up in there. Manual. Okay, so that puts us level with the wing, with the ailerons, okay. Rolls this way, rolls that way. Elevator brings us up, elevator brings us down. Rudder yaws the plane that way, rudder yaws the plane that way. Okay, so we're good on all those axes. Takeoff flaps, that's too much compared to that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna change this to about zero and I'm gonna just put this on minus 100. Actually, I'm gonna do this at minus 10, 15, okay? There's partial deployment for takeoff, full deployment for landing. Two second deployment. Let's go look at the manual again and see if I maybe gave you guys one little bit of advice wrong. The other thing is you'll notice that when I bound that, I had the switch condition in the opposite side. So that means that safe will not be on if I lose radio contact with this. I don't want to demonstrate it on this plane. It's got to be a prop if it hurts somebody, but um, 
what I'll do is I'll just really quick rebind it and then that'll fix that problem. Okay, so throttle cuts on. I want safe to be on, which actually, no, I take it back. All I did is I just switched the direction the, the switch is going. So it should already go to the condition that it would have been. So in that case, we're good. Everything's set up. Uh, now we just need to check our center of gravity and we would technically be ready to fly. So I'm gonna lay this bind plug down and get it out of the way. And it looks like we've got these two spots. So I'm just gonna put my finger under there and my finger under here. I would say that's pretty spot on right there. So uh, let's show the people where you have the battery so that they can refresh your memory on that. I'll just kind of take that camera crew. So you can see where the battery is. I have it clipped into the, I've got one set of holes not filled. So that should work pretty good. And that's a 4,000 milliamp 6S Turnigy heavy duty. And we'll also go ahead and test it with the Zaw after we've made sure it flies with this one because I've got two of these. And I'm just trying to decide if the weather is conducive for a flight. It's kind of a beautiful sunset, but it was windy. So we're going to pause it and we'll come right back. Okay, so folks, uh, it's a little bit windy right now. So you don't realize this in the video footage because of the way I pieced it back together. But this process has taken us pretty much all week since Tuesday or Wednesday. Wednesday. So it is now Saturday evening and it's killing me that I'm not flying because I got home from looking at tractors and uh, which was ridiculous. And uh, it was dead calm. I mean, it was beautiful. <laughs> dead calm. So that's why this is needing to be done ahead of time. You're gonna learn this real quick when you get planes. Get them built, get them ready as fast as you can because you will miss a 15 minute window of beauty. And it was beautiful. There, was not a, there wasn't a hint of wind in, the, in any direction. And now it's like blowing from all directions, confused wind. I just do not wanna demonstrate this plane to you in crappy uh, crappy conditions. It would totally fly these conditions, but I don't want to do that for you. Keep watching guys, there's more. YouTube, we're back to continue this process of assembling the Carbon Z Cub um, 2.1 meter. And if you haven't already seen it in the video, it's because we chose to put the most ridiculously boring parts at the end. Uh, these are two different adapters that will take us from the batteries that I currently have. This is a Zop power. Uh, this is supposedly 70C 6S 4000 milliamp pack. And this is a Turnigy Heavy Duty 4000 milliamp 6S. Um, both of which I do not use um, EC5 connectors or what's in this plane, which is IC5. IC5 has the extra connector. So I'll elaborate on that more at the end of the video if you haven't already seen it, but just so you can see, uh, clearly we've made adapters that will work. The EC5 connector will fit. So you don't have to have the smart batteries. Uh, you can use just whatever you had. If you're using EC5s, you'll be fine. If you use an XT60s, you'll have to build an adapter. If you use an HXT four millimeter, you'll have to change those and uh, build an adapter or switch the one in your plane. In my case, I use both. so. I wanted to build an adapter in this case. Plus then I keep and maintain that smart connector. But in this particular plane, there's not a smart ESC, so it doesn't really matter. So just wanted to elaborate on that. If you haven't seen the part where I build this, just be ready for some extreme boredom. We'll put that at the end of the video. But for now, we're gonna start the assembly process. Um, first remarks, this thing didn't come out on mine. I'll mention that later if you miss it because it's part of the most boring part. Um, I had to stick my fingers into the nose of the plane and then I had to help kind of push up a little bit because it was sticking on the edge. So when I hit the release and the unboxing, it didn't open. So we've got that resolved now and then I added this little tail, just a, a simple little tail of clear tape here. And that just gives you a little something to hang on to so that you can, when releasing it, you can press and release and pull all with one hand. Because generally speaking, you're gonna be holding the transmitter or doing whatever. I use a lanyard, but some of you don't. That being said, we're gonna get this show started here. Uh, don't forget you need a little bit of thread locker for this assembly and then you need CA. And they recommend thin CA for attaching the rudder. So come on over here, camera crew. You'll notice that I've marked this book up. I obviously have gone through, it's a pretty detailed manual, but 
what we're looking at is anytime that I see something that's critical, I highlight it so that I don't forget to, to mention it. This is going to be how we do our setup in the, um, in the radio. There's actually another page as well that talks about the computerized radio setup. In my case, I'm going to be using a DX18, which is over there, and we'll use that to set this plane up. But for now, we're supposed to start the assembly by building the landing gear. The landing gear, of course, are one of the much upgraded parts of this uh, Carbon Cub SS version 2 or whatever you want to call it. So we're going to go ahead and uh, start by grabbing parts. And we've laid them all out on the counter and tables, but we're just going to grab them and bring them over. As you can see, these things are made of steel. They're actually quite strong, so I'm really happy with that. The plastic, believe it or not, is removable here with screws. That is something that you don't typically see on a smaller plane because there's just not enough capacity for the weight. If you wanted to save some, some weight, you could take that off. But it's going to be ugly, I think. So our first step to build this is to identify which side we're working with. So the first thing I usually do when I'm working with a fuse, especially a brand new fuse, you can sit here, camera crew, okay. is I would get a big blanket or a towel or a few blankets or a few towels, whatever it takes to support the weight of the plane. Yes, you can buy supports for these things, um, but since they're always the different size and always irregular, I just kind of refuse to spend money on that because you can do it so easily with other things. Um, and I'm sure I'll get some comments about that. So bring them on people. So we've got this, you have to identify which one's which obviously, uh, the landing gear, if you want to show them on the box, it's pretty evident because the picture and the drawing is, it, it doesn't make it super clear, but obviously if you look at this, the triangle is going to be, um, you know, pointed, pointed that way, if you want to call it. So it's pointed to the back of the aircraft. And then the wheel of course is going to go on the outside, which is pretty obvious to anybody who knows the carbon cub, but if you don't, that's the way it goes. And you'll see in the drawing, it's, it's just awkward to tell which direction it's going maybe from the drawing. So at any rate, uh, the first step, of course, is to install the wheel. And it's just got a collar that keys in here. So we'll go ahead and grab the wheels. We already talked about how squishy these wheels are. Um, they're more squishy than I thought they were going to be. I remember seeing some videos, and I think this might have been a change on the Generation 2 version of this plane, but it used to be a hard foam. Now it's got some give to it, which is pretty cool, but I would still prefer an inflatable tire. A pneumatic tire would be much preferred, in my opinion. Um, they do spin really free, which is nice. I like that. I didn't expect them to be so free. Um, so we're going to Bag K, and we're going, uh, we're going to grab these collars. It's very obvious that these are the correct collars, and that my bag K is obviously not the right thing. So again, you run into this sort of crap with Ryzen, um, but it's, it's thought of, they think about the installation process intuitively enough that it's not a big deal. The Chinese packaging, sometimes it's really bad. Um, so to Horizon's defense, although that is an obvious typo, which is annoying, um, it's it's really obvious because like you can you can really only fit that collar in one spot So you'll find that out as you build the process or as you go through the building process and then obviously you put a little bit of thread locker uh, Where do they say to put the thread locker? I remember seeing that earlier Required adhesive thread locker Install tundra tire. Okay, so ensure set screws are aligned with the flat spots apply thread locker and tighten Okay, that's what I was thinking so I am using a, just a regular Allen wrench and just to let you know the size I'm using, you can usually get away with a metric or a standard, um, but I believe this size is actually a two millimeter size. So if you have a nut driver, or excuse me, not a nut driver, but a, a hex driver that's two millimeters, it'll make this process a lot easier on you. So basically you're going to thread lock that and put it in. I've always found it nice to allow the thread locker to dry when possible. I get these things in kits at work and we don't usually use this style. So I end up with like a million of them. Um, but it's just, uh, I'm just using Loctite 242. You need to keep this off plastic. It will, mark my words, destroy your plastic. So do not get it on the plastic. It will make your plastic brittle and it will absolutely break. No question about it. And by the way, this is dripping so I'm gonna have my 
uh, myself get a paper towel. Normally they don't pop like that, but I guess there's a first time for everything. So it's something about the solvents used to carry this thread locker out is what breaks down the plastic. And you will not be happy with me if you put it in the wrong spot and you have a destroyed plane. So that being said, some people will actually apply this and then let it dry overnight. I'm not that worried about it. And to be honest with you, you know, it works even better than this. Just a little bit of CA. So I'm going to go ahead and put a relatively liberal amount of this thread locker on there because it's going metal on metal guys. So you don't have to be super worried about it here as long as you let it dry and you don't splash it all over everything, which why would that happen? Um, obviously you don't want the thread locker to get down into the actual, um, assembly below. You're blocking my light camera crew. So I'm going to tighten this quite a bit so that I don't have to do it while it's on the shaft. Because the tire gets in the way of the tool. And what we'll do is we'll probably go ahead and go through any redundant steps. We'll pause the video because it would get really boring otherwise. I mean, it's already really boring if you ask me. I'm actually contemplating cutting this out of my entire YouTube experience because the build videos are so tough to film. Um, and it takes up so much time from my otherwise busy schedule. And I know you guys like to see them, but it's just... It doesn't really get much traffic and people don't really care to watch them that much from what I can tell. They like seeing the maidens and all that and I like showing the maidens. So there you have it. So that's what you're going to do. And then you're going to do that on both sides. So we'll pause it and come right back when we get the other side done. Okay. All right guys. So uh, obviously got these done and we're just sliding these in and, and putting them on. We ran into one problem off camera. One of the holes was not big enough. So we used a 560 force. Uh, drill bit just to ream out the hole because the bolts that are in bolt bag B and the nuts that are in bolt pack or bolt pack C uh, The bolts wouldn't slide through so I had to open one of those holes up These are the holes and those allow you to uh, Slide them in the frame here and you'll see like mine are a little bit too narrow So you may find that yours have the same problem. So I'm just gonna have to like bend that out just a hair because you don't want to put a ton of pressure on the actual plastic if you can avoid it. See that, guys? Now it's in. But there's a lot of pressure. I don't like that at all. I was just waiting for it to break while I did that, but that's a little bit better. It's still not perfect, but... Um, okay, so basically where we ran into our problem is on the bottom here. We got the first one in okay. But then the, uh, the second one was just hideous to get through because it's extremely hard to get a tool onto this and hold it because there's like nowhere to put it. Um, so we struggled with a different couple of different options, one of which is I broke an Allen wrench and I put it into a drill. Well, you can't make enough of an angle to get that to work unless you have a ball joint end. Um, so if you have a ball end, you can do that, which will help you because you can get in and then turn it at an angle. Um, but in my case, I'll just show you what we're going to do to make this work um, and struggle through this one. The other thing is the fuselage wants to tip on you, so we just had to lay it down on its side, which helped a lot. And you see this is, the, the directions show this going in at an angle, or excuse me, not going in at an angle, but going in toward the, toward the rear of the aircraft. And man, that one fits so much worse, doesn't it? Yeah. Crew? The other mm -hmm. one was was really a pretty good fit actually and you shouldn't need he hemostats to do this sort of thing but uh, or forceps whichever you prefer but I'm pretty much having to use them or I can't get this together there it goes so it's in okay so once it's in you would think okay well that's no big deal you'll just grab this extremely small nut I mean if your nuts are this small, <laughs> you're going to have trouble seeing them. If you have to zoom to see your nuts, you're in problem. Yeah. And if they come in a nut sack like this, there's, there's a ton of nuts in there. At least you got more than two. So anyway, I pulled these two nuts out of the nut sack, and we're going to put those on right now. Sorry, I didn't inject that. 
straight into the story here. But basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the hemostats or the forceps here. And we are going to grasp the nut. And we're gonna hold it so that we can get this started. Now these are nylocks, no less. So because they're nylocks, you better not think about putting any thread lock around there. You will have problems if you do that. And if you do that and you have problems, don't complain to me because I warned you about it. Uh, the nylon will be eaten and or weakened and brittled is the correct technical terminology. Um, that's what's gonna happen. So now you guys get to experience firsthand uh, exactly what I was running into and you will be running into when you build yours. See, I finally got good purchase with the tool. Now I've got it on there. And so what I found worked decently um, was basically, crap, I gotta, I gotta spin this up, then hold it, then spin it down, then spin it up, then hold it, then spin it down, then spin it up. This is just really awkward. Can you go to the other side, please, camera mm -hmm. crew? No, the other side on my left because you're out of my way there. But you guys can kind of get the idea of like how awkward this is because when you're not onto the nylon, it's not maybe such a big deal because you could just go on finger tight like that. But once you get to the nylon part, then it's got a lot of resistance. And so that's how I found worked okay. You gotta keep in mind, there's all this other plastic here so you can't get around it, it's at an angle. So it actually goes down to like past zero position here, if you want to call it that. So you just don't get very much purchase each time, but you will eventually get it if you just keep doing this. Um, the forceps worked nicely for most of it until they got until it got really tight on the other one. At which point I had to see this is like digging into my thumb now. I suppose if a guy had a longer Allen wrench, you could probably put the Allen wrench through that one and then just feed it all the way in. Um, but I doubt you're gonna fit an Allen wrench through those holes. I just don't think it's gonna fit. Okay, so we're almost there. And then I'll show you how much easier it is to do the other one. See, so it's wanting to spin, so you really gotta get on there with the forceps, you can see it bend in the head of the forceps. The good news is you don't have to worry about these things coming off unintentionally, um, unless that plastic breaks, which is like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen before the bowl breaks, but I, I could be wrong, you know? So here's the other side. The other side is much easier. Um, you still have to have something to hold onto the nut. So like if you had a small pair of needle nose pliers, which was the alternative that I felt like was a good alternative for many people are gonna have that and you can just stick that in there. And then on this side, it's actually quite easy because you can get a drill at it. And see how much easier that is, guys? Like when you can actually get a tool to it. So anyway, there you have it. So now you've got, now you've got that freedom of movement on the landing gear so that they can splay out on a rough landing. And that does look pretty sweet, by the way, doesn't that camera crew? Mm -hmm. See, this is free. This is not. It's not such a big deal. The springs are going to be strong enough to, to pull them back to the position that they need to be. So at this point, it should balance somewhat. I'm going to push that one down so that they're splayed out to the same angle. So now we can pick this back up. Of course, I had to go dig through my, my tools because... A lot of these random sizes, of course, Horizon doesn't give you that, which is really annoying. Um, you know, I mean, if you buy like a piece of Ikea furniture, you'll get an entire tool set. <laughs> so I don't know why Horizon can't send an Allen wrench that fits. So now we have to assemble these. Basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this thing and you're gonna go like a this. I believe you just hook these through like that. And I, I might be mistaken, but it just seems like they're they're gonna just go with pressure, okay? So I don't know that it matters which which direction it goes, but I'm just gonna favor it this way. Because that seems to be the way the directions are showing it. 
I'll get it lined up and then in we go. So guys, this is, this is a pretty awesome landing gear setup, I think, for a stock setup. It's disappointing that it can't be assembled, but I understand why Horizon does that. Because to be perfectly honest, the package would just be huge. And I mean, if your package is that huge, you're gonna have problems. You're gonna run into things all the time. Um, and so, I don't know. You just gotta be careful with that. So you'll see, now they're hooked together, which of course, they don't really show that, but you're gonna use the same bolts and you're gonna same, same nuts. So same bolts and same nut sack. Uh, these ones were incidentally labeled correctly B and C. And so I'm just gonna grab one of these. And uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and fasten those with one nut and we'll do this one live for you because uh, we did run into quite a bit of, bit of trouble on that first one over here. So we'd like you to see that so you can see my initial frustration and um, if there's lots of beeping in the video, <laughs> Extra you'll, you'll understand excitement. why there was. Um, I want my bolt to go like this so that it's in the same orientation as the other, um, which is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna just grab my nuts uh, with this tool and just squeeze the nuts really hard. Where are you even putting it? Oh, I'm sticking okay. it in the hole here, guys. So that's gonna hold this spring just like that. And see, then there, there's just enough spring tension that you don't have to actually hold it the whole time, which is super nice. I didn't anticipate that, so that's cool. And so I can do the exact same thing here. And then just don't forget to put your nuts in because if you don't stick your nuts in, it's gonna be a problem, right? Yeah, definitely. You're like, <laughs> stick my nuts in. <laughs> so I'm gonna tighten these nuts right now and you wanna give them a shot from the other side. These are way better guys, cause you can actually get to them. Looks like this assembly underneath is actually going to be what receives for uh, your floats more than likely. Oh, good Lord. I think it's hard to get out of there. Um, So we'll see if we can get this. Just show them kind of the angle of the, the screw gun there too, hon, so they can kind of see that I'm able to get away with that small deviation of straight. Okay. And you don't want to tighten these so much that you deviate, or not deviate, but you don't want to squish this plastic in. It's not going to cause it to bind because there's quite a bit of play. It's just more a matter of you don't want to crack the plastic. And do not use thread locker on this. If you use thread locker on this plastic, you will be replacing this whole plate. It will break. I'm giving you the 100% guarantee. Um, okay, that is awesome, guys. Let's just show them. Oh man, those are stiff as, you know what? Like watch, I figured they'd be like really, really easy to bend, but they're actually pretty hard to bend. So to be honest with you, I'm guessing it's gonna be somewhat ineffective at this weight. When we get everything put together, it's gonna to be a little better. Okay guys, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reset real quick and make sure we're prepared for the next step so we don't waste a whole lot of your time. Um, but to be honest with you at this point, who's counting? Okay, so for the next step, we gotta attach the rudder. And for that, you need some thin uh, CA, this foam safe CA. You don't, I don't think you have to use foam safe CA, but I'm gonna use foam safe CA. And you should use foam safe CA if you wanna resist the temptation to melt your foam on your expensive plane. Um, so first, what you need to do is find your D-bag right here. The bag, so, the little bag. The little bag, it's a, it's a D-bag, people. Um, so just reach into your D-bag, <laughs> gross, and be prepared with a screw, okay? So this screw is the same uh, drive size of the last page, so I need to get that particular Allen tool. Um, so once you've got that out of the D-bag, you're gonna basically stick this on and be prepared, okay? So that's the way that's gonna go, okay? Uh-oh, camera crew is spotting if it, just in case, just in case. Okay. So the first instructions say slide it into the holes. And I'm like, you know, usually when I'm sliding in and I just go by feel. Um, but like, <laughs> I don't even know where to stick it. <laughs> In the hole. See this? Like, where, where's it supposed to go, guys? 
looks like. But when you find the hole, you'll so know. Wiggle it around a little. You have to wiggle it around. And um, this is, you know, it's not really a good time for a D-bag to be mm -mm. involved. No. Get in there. See, I'm just trying to ram it in. Give him a close-up shot of the ramming. I cannot find the hole, guys. Look at this. This is ridiculous. Um, I'm sorry. I'm probably blocking your view. I know it's better. It's it's better if you can see what's going on when I'm trying to ram it in there. But well, I mean, it's not, awkward to not just not always. be able to see. I honestly, I I do see the slot now, maybe. Yeah. Um, but see, once you pull out, then it's like you know, sometimes things come to an end. Get in there. Get in there. This one is just not behaving. The top hinge. The CA hinge material is pretty resilient, so I'm not really worried about damaging it, but I prefer not damage the finish on the, the rudder itself. And so I think what I might, I might, oh, oh, I found there the goes. hole. It's in, it's in, all the way in. Wow, that's Ooh. good. Fits good. So that rudder, man, that rudder is beautiful. So now we're just gonna take the uh, D-bag screw and we will. But when do we glue it? We glue it after we penetrate with the D-bag screw. Again, we have a, a screw with an Allen wrench that runs into everything as we're trying to screw it in. Now, yeah. real quick highlight, guys. I have a better set of these things, but I'm just a little bit too lazy to get them out. So I'm actually going to do that right this second <laughs> because it is getting pretty stinking old having to fight those short ones. Let's see if this fits into the D-bag. Oh yeah, it fits good. Look at this guys, so much better. What have we learned? Stick the right tool in the right hole and you will have a better day. And do it a half Show them the gap thinner. here guys. Show them the gap, you see the what? Let go of the plane. Oh. You see this gap here? So what's gonna happen is as I tighten the screw, the gap on this could potentially close. So you need to be mindful as you tighten this, you wanna keep the clearance reasonable. And then you see this clearance here, camera crew? See that clearance between the plastic on the rudder and the plastic on the fuse? Mm -hmm. You need to keep those clearances good because watch what happens. If I tighten this too much, we're just clearing. So I'm actually gonna back it off like a quarter turn, okay? So that's what I'm gonna recommend you do. You don't have to do it my way, um, but I, I would highly recommend that you do it that way. Um, so that you have the best luck possible. Now, the manual suggests tipping the rudder first and then applying the thin CA to both sides of the hinges. So one, two, three, flip it over, and then one, two, three. So I'm gonna glue it here, so if you wanna show the people at home, you'll notice that you need to get this in a position where you're gonna want it, because remember, once you glue it, it's gonna stay there, right? So if you're wanting to have a small gap, you see how there's an air gap there, guys? Mm -hmm. If you want it tight so it's almost touching, you're not gonna get that here, okay? So I recommend you try to make it even so that you don't have a closed gap and an open gap. So I'm gonna gap this out like that, and then I'm gonna turn it. And then I'm gonna come in here and just give it a couple squirts right into the hole. Okay? So just squirt it right in the hole. Don't worry about how many people are watching, just squirt it right in. Okay, now this CA works quickly, um, but it's not instantaneous, okay? So if you were to turn this right now, you could potentially take the finish off of your plane. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just turn it because I like squirting in the hole. So I'm gonna do that right now. Right here, I'm just squirting right into the crack where we rammed it in. So, um, can you get a better view for them so they can actually see what's happening from over here maybe? And then that way they can see where I squirted it in the hole right there. Because otherwise they're just going to use your imagination and there's no fun in that. Not when it comes to that sort of thing. So that's it guys. I mean that's, that's all the squirting you got to do. Um, and by the way that should be the last time you need thin CA unless you choose to use thin CA for your Loctite. Um, incidentally, you can use this thin CA with the Nylox, okay? So if you decided to do it, I wouldn't recommend using the thin. I would just use the medium thick, which is purple cap. Or 
Um, actually, it's a pink cap. But if you go to a purple cap, then you would have an actual thick. So anyway, we're just gonna let this set for a minute and pause it and come right back when we're done with the D-bag and ramming it into holes and spraying. All right guys, so we're back. Uh, we reached into our C-bag and grabbed a nut out of the nut sack. And uh, we got out of the E-bag, we got a bolt. So we're gonna go ahead and take the linkage for the rudder control horn and we're gonna put this on top and notice there's a ball joint in here. That's pretty sweet. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually stick it into the most innermost hole. I'm not gonna stick it to the outermost hole um, because I figure I'm gonna do that shortly. Anyway, I'm gonna just move it to that hole um, at some point. So I might as well just do it now instead of wasting my time and wasting your time. I can always set up a little extra expo or some dual rate action. Um, but there is something to be said for having this in the middle hole as instructed by the manual. Um, Horizon is usually pretty good about instructions on stuff like this. Sometimes their planes or any plane would be maybe hypersensitive to the rudder axis control for the yaw control. Um, so if you find that you'd prefer to, hey, I can use a drill. Can use the drill, people. Woohoo! Did that tool just fall off of there? No, I don't think so. Okay, so I'm just going to come in here like this and just ram it. Remember, this is a nylock. Okay, give them a shot from the other side so they can see how much I'm purchasing. You guys see that? So we've got plenty of freedom there, okay? I'm gonna actually back it off just a hair. So show them right here, hon. This clearance right there. You guys see that? No, no, like this. Like right here. There you go. That's perfect. So you see, you gotta be able to Make sure that moves free, guys. I know some of these things I talk about on the videos are like super no-brainers, but that's a no-brainer to somebody who's built like a bunch of these planes. And uh, to be honest with you, if you're building a plane of this size, it's probably not your first plane. But if it is your first plane, you may not know that. So anyway, more rationale. So the next step, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be putting on the horizontal stabilizer. This of course is the vertical stabilizer and the rudder. And so this one's gonna be super easy. We basically have to get the carbon fiber spar, which is what supports the uh, structural strength between the two. And then we're gonna get uh, both sides of this. Uh, I have had Verizon send me two of the same wing. So if you ever get two of the same, they won't work right obviously but it's always a good idea to just kind of dry fit them, make sure they're gonna go together once you get them in the plane, which these are gonna work gloriously. I'm gonna go. And ironically enough, this is a neutral air airfoil. And if you didn't already know this guys, a lot of times on real planes, there's actually an, and they're gonna actually produce, um, not lift, but they're gonna pull the wing down, which is kind of interesting. So not by the, angle of incident, it'll actually be uh, because it'll do a reverse airflow. Okay, so that's in there square. I've always had luck doing it that way. You don't have to do it that way. It's just the way it's worked well for me. And then I just uh, rammed this rod right through one at a time. Now there's four bolts that have to be attached on here. And when I say bolts, I mean screws. I believe they're self-tapping screws. Um, so you'll notice that it says R on this one. Probably says L on the other one, but it's so freaking self-explanatory that if you need that, you probably should not be building this plane. I even knew that. Megan knew. I'm sorry, not Megan, the camera crew. <laughs> Where's the rest of that crew anyway? I don't know. Okay, so that's obviously loose at this point. Uh, so we're going to have to attach that at some point, but we need to get in the F bag. This is the F bag, okay? So these are a hex machine head, uh, two by 10 millimeters. So we're going to pull out four of those. We'll probably just start one and then we will pause it because it will be extremely boring to watch me screw these in. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe you're into watching me screw things. I don't, you know, I'm good. Yeah. You're good. Okay. We got at least one person that doesn't care to watch me screw things. So that that was super easy, actually. It's a miracle. Wow, that was like the best alignment I've ever had on a Horizon hobby or any plane ever. Are you sure that was? 
It was it? no, like it's uh, it's it, wrong. it worked perfect. I couldn't believe how good, guys. This is like a field install thing, and it actually worked well. Like you might actually be able to tolerate that to fit in your Honda Civic. That's what my wife was saying when we were off camera. She's making fun of all you Honda Civic drivers. I was not. Yeah, she was like, she was like, how are you gonna fit that in your Honda Civic? And I was like, don't, don't make fun of the Honda Civic drivers. I'm glad you never insulted anyone on YouTube. You, no. That's good. I don't insult people. You can even get that in my Traverse. Yeah, the Traverse. So anyway, folks. So we're just gonna ram these in. I thought it was gonna be extreme boredom, but I mean, watching these was, these things, wow! Talk I about would do a that any day. Wow! Whew. Who wants to watch a TV show? You could just watch me screw things endlessly. <laughs> I don't know. There's probably something online you could do if you wanted to see. It. It's just... But yeah, these four screws are going to hold the horizontal stabilizer in position, and then as you already know. There is a carbon fiber rod that goes between them, but then there's also a collar that goes around that that's built into each side. So there's quite a little bit of strength in these things. And I just want to demonstrate this by throwing it off the mountain. Just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. But look, these things are, are not perfectly stiff, but they're stiffer than, you know, they're stiff enough to get the job done. And as long as it's stiff enough to get the job done, don't complain, right? That's what really matters. Yeah. So we also need to, uh, get a, a nut out of the, the nut sack here from the C bag. A C nut sack. C nut sack. There you go. C nut sack. Here it is. We got one nut. And then we are going to put, uh, looks like they want us to use another E, which are the smaller size here. Horizon is very good about giving extra screws. They don't always give extra screws on every item. So it's a little bit hard to know which ones they intend you to have extras on. But you can pretty much mark my words, there should be a few extras, I just don't know which ones. So, you're gonna notice another thing that's tough. Okay, um, I wanna put this screw through, okay? Right here, okay? They're suggesting that you go into the middle hole. Now this is an elevator, pitch sensitivity is a pain in the butt. So you don't wanna go into the outer, or the innermost hole, unless you know you're gonna be doing 3D flying. If you do, you are gonna compromise some of the sensitivity of the controls, or excuse me, the, um, how do I want to say this? Well, let me just explain it to you in flight. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and do like what the manual says on the elevator. Because I, I typically don't need a lot of extra elevator. I mean, some people claim you don't even need an elevator. Well. But that guy disappeared. I've never heard from him again. Really? So I, yeah, I hope he's alive still. I mean, mm. you don't need an elevator. It's like, maybe, maybe he flew a real airplane without an elevator. <laughs> And well, we, we hope if not. you're out there, if you're out there, tell me in the comments below. Did was it the elevator? <laughs> um, what, 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 you, what, what was his name? I don't even remember. He was a nice guy. He's I know, but very extremely detailed. I mean, like if you guys think Wait, I'm detailed, I was gonna say. If you guys think I'm detailed, mm -hmm. I mean, this guy puts me to shame. He's like, you're the cliff notes, you know. <laughs> Cliffs. That's Cliffs. That was wasn't it, his name. No, it wasn't Cliffs. That's why that guy doesn't have a YouTube channel. It was whatever. His YouTube channel would be awesome. He had like 50 hour videos. If you think my videos are good, mine are only like two and a half hours. For something that would, you know, like Horizon might put out like a five minute like like corporate reminder. Get out of there. Jeez. Man, these nuts really sticky. No, what Sticky what happened are the to worst. Them? Jeez. With all this pausing. <laughs> you never know. What's happening <laughs> off camera? <laughs> Dang it. Uh, okay, so guys, just to be clear. Oh my goodness. Seriously, they keep sticking in the mold. What am I doing wrong? I don't know. So you see this? There's a little bit of slop and a little bit of play. And I want a little bit of slop, you know, in this gap here, okay? That way there's zero resistance, okay? You could probably, you could probably tighten it and just torque that thing into the hole as hard as you want. And it would just make those two surfaces bind like crazy. But you do have a big servo that's pushing it. So if you don't mind burning out your servos, just torque it all the way down. Yeah, that way this thing will barely move. It'll be great. Okay, moving along guys. Hey, you know what's weird? There's a collar here 
horizon on this rudder, okay? And I noticed something about this collar. There is no. There is no. Let's show the people at home. Where's the thread locker, folks? Folks, give them a really close shot. Like, really <laughs> get up in there. No, so that you're looking at it from the top. Right there. Perfect. Do you see any thread locker? It would be blue. Yeah. Is it always blue? Does it have it's to be blue? It's not always blue, but it usually is. It doesn't look like there's any there. I think there's none there, guys. It's making me nervous. You know, because I don't have that size collar and just sitting around, except for probably the extras they gave me. So, I'm going to just do a precautionary measure if I can get the right size tool. By the way, that is like the world's largest collar for such a small thing. Ooh, it's it's stuck in there good. Maybe it is Red Locker. Maybe they glued it. Maybe. Maybe they glued it. Watch for it on Maiden. That's where my daughter points. <laughs> Over there. Yeah. All right. Now that you have that inside joke, all 400 of you that watch this, <laughs> we are going to mount the engine. Um, and when I say engine, I don't mean a gasoline engine. I mean an electric motor. But we can call it an engine. For Get off my back! Man, that looks cool, doesn't it? The mm -hmm. camera crew, she has to say yes to things like that. Because otherwise, it would it'd be self-defeating, right? <laughs> so, of course that looks really cool. No, she likes, she there's loves a, this stuff. There's a few I don't like that aren't my favorite. Okay, so we're gonna get a good view just right down here. Here's the electronic speed control. Notice that this is just a dumb one with a heat sink. It's not got the smart technology. Let me tell you something, Horizon. There is nothing smart about replacing every single battery you got. I was just, I just thought of that. But anyway, okay. Um, oh, it, hold on, Horizon, one more thing. There's nothing smart about coming out with a, a new stupid technology that I need new connectors for. Sorry, that's not smart. That's dumb. So I won't be buying any. Unless you send them to me for free, and then I'll review them and say how awesome they are. Okay, back to the move here. We've got to get the motor. My wife can find that one. I mean, the camera crew. See this? Look at that. Mm -hmm. That's probably, I think that's the motor. I think that's it. It's kind of huge. It is. Show the people how big it is. Okay. Then we need to get some, um, this, I was confused about this drawing earlier. I tried to review it and I couldn't figure out the bag G. So this is the G bag. Okay. So does that look like a lock washer to you? Um, it looks, no. oh, it is in there though. Is it? Yeah, it's in there with the bolts. Okay, oh. trade spots. I'm right handed. Did you not know it was right handed? So am I. Jeez. How many, totally how many decades does it take to get that down? Apparently more than two. We're that old? Uh, almost. When did the, what happened? I know. Okay, so I just have to slide this into there. And they did actually come out. Oh, bag G and then bag G and then G. Okay. So G is going to be rammed through this, okay, just like that. So we got to do that four times, folks, and then this is going to bite into the plastic here, okay? So it's just going to bite into the plastic, so you don't have to do anything super fancy, but I would recommend uh, doing this in such, such a way that it's it's easy as it can be. You want the wires to go downward. Of course, they don't show that in the drawing. God forbid they would actually give instruction. Um, Make sure you have the right size, which I do not. So hold that thought. I'm gonna try my flight test tool. Mm. I think it might be the right size. Dang it, it's not the right size. You failed me again, flight test. Actually, they didn't fail me. They've never failed me. Flight test is awesome. I love those guys, they do a good job. Uh, okay, so uh, just uh, thinking about the long tools, I'm going to need to get another long one because I can't reach my short one into that deep hole. <sighs> so we're going to do this right here. This is awkward. <laughs> I might need your help to oh, okay. prevent the plane from moving, I wonder. Well, well I don't know. It seems to be kind of... It's biting, so I'll just get a second one in there and go for it. Okay. Maybe we're okay. So these lock washers are kind of a joke, guys. I'll be honest with you. 
of all the stuff on this plane so far, this makes me the most nervous. And I will tell you why, because look how coarse that thread is. Yes, these are going into plastic, but when you have a thick um, thread going into a plastic body, it's gonna be likely to crack, okay? Especially on a freaking gigantic motor like this. So I know that somebody thought about it that's smarter than me in China. <clears throat> so I'm sure they thought it through and they d decided that this screw was like a tenth of a, uh, well, a thousandth of a cent cheaper. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing that so that I could pay the most expensive price possible for it. I'm just afraid it's going to break them out, guys. That's all. I'm just, it is a, it is a legitimate concern. Because there's nothing worse than having uh, one of these things come undone and, you know, the motor comes off and it hits like all of your family members in the face simultaneously and then hits the house after hitting the house, it burns the house down and then the YouTube channel gets demonetized, which <laughs> would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. I mean. Which part? The demonetized <laughs> But no, I, you know, everybody else was okay. Um, I usually have people that are really concerned for the safety of, and well-being of my family members. And we're, we're okay. It's been a little better since I'm not in the neighborhood. Um, but the thing is, what most of you guys don't realize is we had a pretty good, pretty good time. Our old house, our neighbors were really cool. And uh, if our neighbors weren't cool, we wouldn't have gotten away with like half of the crap we did there. <laughs> Um, so if you guys have crappy neighbors, like generally speaking, normal neighbors, then you probably can't do what I do. You have to go buy an acreage first. That was part of the deal with this plane, by the way. So story time while I tighten these nuts and bolts. Oh, that's not fitting. I got to get a different size. Um, you guys may run into this problem too. Sometimes I'll use a, a standard or a metric and I never know. Horizon is pretty bad about that because they own... Uh, the tower hobbies line up and you know some of that stuff was all standard imperial measurements like inches and then they have a lot of Chinese stuff too which is of course going to be metric and then they have some European stuff so it is actually pretty hard this seems to fit better with a 2.5 millimeter size driver so as you make your decision on whether to go to with a metric or a standard of course, you're going to find those break points where you can't quite get it to go once you really get it under load. So, story time, guys. Acreage, I think. About what? About the acreage. Oh, about the acreage. So, part of the reason that I'm getting this plane now is because, you know, we've got all these, like, unforeseen expenses. And i got to go buy a tractor now, which, I mean, it's like, seriously, green acres. Um, but I, I don't want to buy a tractor, but I need a tractor. And it is going to be kind of cool to have a tractor. But uh, I can think of, I don't know, at least 10 or 15 other things that I would rather do with $25,000 than to buy a tractor. <laughs> it would be cool to have a tractor, and I'm excited to have the capability that the tractor brings. Holy crap, that feels like it's moving them out. Ah, why don't you give them a shot in here? Ow. Oh, that hurts my fingertip. Hurts. Hurts. Hurts my feelings too. I'm sorry. So watch this, guys. I'm just gonna whoa. The right tool for the job, guys. If this breaks horizon, I am gonna seriously come out there and not punch you in the face hole. I'm gonna call you and complain without <laughs> any accosting whatsoever. <laughs> um but anyway, so back to story time, folks. If you follow that whole chain of thought. <laughs> Oh, it didn't break. It just slipped out. No big deal. So, another story time. We're just going to come back to that tractor. I don't want to spend 25 grand on a tractor. Mm -mm, not really. We don't really have 25 grand for a tractor. Yeah, really. So, unless you guys want to send me a tractor in the mail. <laughs> That'd be great. Which would be pretty cool if somebody had a tractor they could send me in the mail. Um, I, do, I do want a tractor with an end loader and a three-point hitch on the back. So, for those of you that know what a three-point hitch is, it's what you use to pull implements on the back, you know, for like farmers and things, people that do work in the earth. Farmy things. Farmy things. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the front, the loader, of course, is going to be a bucket that goes up and down. So 
Um, again, not to insult anybody's intelligence, but I don't know if you guys are into that sort of stuff since you're watching an RC airplane get built. <laughs> um, I'm assuming that if you're into this particular airplane, you may also live on an acreage and you might already have an awesome tractor. And I'm gonna tell you something, guys. I was looking at an AC WD-45 and I was all excited. And I'm probably gonna break this guy's heart next week because the hydraulics wouldn't work and then there was a tire that was empty and it's gonna cost a thousand bucks to fix the tire. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure I'm into that. So, or, well, it costs a thousand bucks for a new tire and rim. But uh, I decided, I think I'm probably moving on from that one, but we'll see. We'll see, hopefully he doesn't watch this video. <laughs> but the thing is, I, I feel bad because the guy's a super nice guy and I, I felt like I was maybe kind of helping him out by buying it and he was kind of feel like he was helping me out by selling it to me for the price he was. Um, but I found out it's also not a 45 horsepower engine, which is something he led me to believe. I don't think on purpose, I don't think he meant to lie to me, it just happened. So it turns out it's a 30 horsepower engine, so kind of a big difference between 30 and 45 horsepower. So, and then also not being able to get the hydraulics to work means that we couldn't get it on the trailer, which means we couldn't get it to the house, which means I basically didn't pay him. And I'm like, okay, if we can get it to work, then maybe I'll buy it. but. We gotta go add hydraulic oil, just get the hydraulics to work. And then we can, just one thing after another. But it's like, when you buy a project like that, it is a project. Let's show the people at home how this looks. Wowzers, that is so tight. You know what, I, I wanna lift this thing up by the motor just to show you how strong the bell housing is. This is a bell housing here. And then in there you can see all the magnetic coils. Of course that's gonna be how it, there's magnets, there's fixed magnets on here. This is a brushless motor. Um, but you can you can you can pretty much pick up the plane by this, but I don't want to break the bearings on this. But it's extremely strong and it feels very robust. So if I were to try to turn this, it's just I'm not gonna probably have such good luck because these oh yeah, that's all I can possibly get. That was the last one. I just wanted to show you that that I'm doing that by oh that one ain't going anywhere. So this is the last step you do when you tighten a motor that's gonna get covered up and hidden. Once it's hidden, you're not getting back to it. So you might as well do this right now and waste some more time with your viewers and then finish your story. So anyway, I am now expanding my search for a tractor and uh, having a cool tractor will, will be an improvement in lifestyle, but also a big expense and another maintenance concern so if you guys know the awesome tractor that I need to buy, just let me know. I'm putting this back in the G bag, guys, because there was five. So we're done with that. Now we can go ahead and assemble the prop and spinner, which of course is located over here, folks. One of the chintziest, crappiest parts of this plane, in my humble opinion, which there's not many humble opinions I have, but this is one of them, is this spinner looks like crap. Look at that, it's cheap, it's weak looking. This should have been silver, metal, uh, something more cool than just an orange cover. Um, I am okay with it, it's fine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run it, it'll be no big deal. It is light, but the thing is, if you need nose weight, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna go to the store and you're gonna get yourself an aluminum one at least. It'll look cooler and it'll probably be a good solution. So, in order to do this, let's show me the assembly uh, camera crew. So obviously there's some texture here, and then there's less texture there, okay? So we need to get this part, this bag. It's not labeled, so they uh, strayed from their labeling system. And they went ahead and just labeled the parts as though we know what the heck they're talking about. I'll show you how all this stuff works, guys, don't worry. Brian's here to save the day from Horizon. Okay, this is gonna go on here. This is called a collet and a prop adapter. And that's gonna squish these down and it's gonna bite the shaft right like that. As you compress this, it's gonna squish this tighter, okay? It's gonna grab the shaft and hang on for all dear life, okay? Notice one thing, that fits, okay? So you do not have to have this on first, okay? You do before you put the prop on, so just be aware of that. So let's go ahead and land these wires. They did not tell me to land these wires, incidentally, um, not by picture. But you know, because I like picture menu, I like go up to the <laughs> go up to 
uh, McDonald's and I'm like, hey, do you have a picture menu? Because I can't read. Changlish. And then they're like, what the heck are you talking about, Brian? So I don't go to McDonald's either. Do okay. I? No. I don't. Not Sorry. with me. No. Because you won't sit with me in a room after that. <laughs> okay, so you see that? Fancy, right? Smart thing you can do. I'm going to show you a trick, guys. This is, this is, this is a super complicated one, too. Watch this. Taped. Watch this. I'm going to tape over this. Now, why am I taping over this? What, what are you doing, Brian? Why? Why? Why are you doing that? Because I don't want them to come off. And you'll be surprised how that little teeny bit of protection will not only keep this joint a little bit drier if you get some splashing if you were to fly this on floats, which this plane does support flying off of floats. They're expensive, by the way. I think they're like 120 bucks or something crazy oh, like that. Great. Yeah, so my wife is just giving me the no, the no <laughs> symbol. I did not. Just one finger. <laughs> she didn't do that. Um, so this ESC needs to be slid back some, and then this wire has to go in. Um, but just be mindful, guys. There's a heat sink on the top of that. So if you have to pick between above and below or whatever, you have to be a little bit careful about this because obviously you don't want to like do you don't want to like zip tie it to the motor. You know? Really? Oh, yeah, you don't want to do that. That's so glad you were here. That's right. But what you do want to do is you don't want it to touch at all and have any friction because it will catch fire and blow up in a million pieces. Well, that would be entertaining. I don't want to give anybody ideas. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to actually throw a zip tie around that. You know why zip ties are good, guys? Zip ties are good because they're cheap and they're effective. And uh, it's in this drawer that's right here. So I'm going to use one. You could, you could use a variety of other uh, choices that would work, but just be careful. Twisty ties have a piece of metal in them and they do get hot, uh, these wires do. So just be a little bit careful about doing that maybe. And just look what I'm doing. All I'm doing, just super simple. I'm not gonna like go to town so tight that I can't ever get it out of there easy. You know what I mean, Gene? Mm-hmm. Are you Gene? Not today. See this? So now it's tight. They didn't, they didn't show that in the instructions, but they meant to show it. Okay, so now when the motor spins, obviously we're not gonna have a problem with that, okay? Everybody happy? Good. So now this goes back here, but obviously we gotta start putting this together. So that's our next step. Um, so we're just gonna stick this right, you know, right here, see this guys? Oh, it's so gorgeous. So now um, we gotta get the screws, which are from the D-bag again. We're just gonna reach back into the D-bag. Ugh, oh, so gross. Okay, got it here, got it here, guys. I'm gonna take this. This is where you're gonna like, lots of swearing is gonna happen. So I gotta, it's family show, guys. <laughs> family show, all the D-bags. So we're gonna tighten this in here. Remember folks, what I, what I meant by, this is lots of swearing is gonna happen is because you're gonna drop it. It's gonna be inside the cowling. So that was probably the easiest screw. Shh, don't say it, you're not done. I'm not done, that's true. You hear it popping and hissing mm -hmm. in there? Yeah. And it makes me nervous. It makes me nervous like popping and hissing on a, a foam model usually means that you crush the wrong thing in the wrong place and there's hell to pay. Great. I know. But you hear the popping and hissing? Mm hmm It stopped. Ooh. Oh. Gross. Ooh. Oh, it sounds so mean. That's tight now. I don't know. It's a cowling. I mean, how tight do you need a cowling? That vent know. is not very big either, guys. Look at that vent. Ooh, not very big. That's like? big. This is big. I like that. But, like, this isn't very big. Did you say it's smiling? Yeah. Oh. It looks like a face. It's mad. Sorry. Um, okay, so now we're going to put Jay on. This is, evidently, this is Jay, guys. Yeah. Say hi to Jay. Okay, Jay's going to go back here. The clearance is going to look beautiful. Okay, remember your prop. There's some texture on the back. There's texture on the, uh, on the, there's no texture on the front. Here, it's smooth. But then this texture will bite there, okay? Hmm. And then that's smooth. And then it's labeled 15.7. So remember, guys, 15 inches here, 7 inches worth of purchase okay 
do you understand seven inches of play four so if you have a higher pitch let's say it's ten then you're gonna have ten inches as opposed to seven okay does that make sense to you it's a corkscrew okay to me or to them then yes to you <laughs> All right, so slide that back. Make sure you get a, a decent. You can also think of it this way. Don't put Loctite in there because you will break your nose cone. I've personally done it. It's very embarrassing. Feel my nut. This thing is so light. I mean, Whoa. It's, isn't that weird? That is weird. Here, feel it again. I thought you were being facetious. Yeah, facetious. <laughs> Sounds like you're being facetious. Trying to be nice. <laughs> okay, so now we need to grab a crescent wrench because I'm too lazy to get the correct size wrench. And we're gonna tighten this on here. So you guys, it's kind of like it's kind of like running downhill building these planes. Once you get the D bag emptied out, you start clearing out the nut sacks. All downhill. It's you know the next thing you know, you get an airplane sitting on your counter, and you're like, wow, that looks pretty awesome. Let's go fly it in the dark. No. Oh, okay, never mind. All right, H bag, H bag, right here. Goodness gracious, Horizon. Couldn't you have made these things take the same screws? No is the answer. What is that a screw? Oh. A, yeah, it's a screw. It's just to say. They did give us a spare on that. Guys, this is the type of spare that's good to have. Because this is a stupid type of screw that you will lose. And and you're probably like, well, why would I lose that plane? Well, if you don't know, then you haven't flown plane very much. Um, because people lose stupid nose cones all the time because you're out on the field and you're screwing around and you end up nosing over and hitting the grass or breaking a prop or doing something stupid. And next thing you know, you gotta sit there and fix it out in the field and then this one little screw drops and you got 10 guys standing in a circle, like, well, what are we gonna do now, Brian? I don't know. Who's got a magnet? Anybody got a magnet? Uh, it's a stainless steel screw, Jimmy. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up, George. It's not stainless. It's nickel plated. <laughs> and then three hours later, you find it and you're like, well, it's raining now. <laughs> That's exactly the way it goes. H. All right, guys, H. Yeah, I got it. I, I wasn't getting good purchase at the end there. Hey, guys, if you want this to fit tighter, for real, you can use a little bit of CA if you need to. But honestly, you really shouldn't need to. If you need to, you've done something wrong. I'm just joking about that last part. You haven't done anything wrong. You can do it. Um, this 1 16th of an inch is not working though. I'm gonna go to the metric size, which would be 1.5 millimeters. We'll see if that goes. Are you making fun of the way I pronounce that? <laughs> nope, not at all. Okay. Oh yeah, it's going way deeper. Mm. Ooh, wow. Ooh, yeah, that's good. Didn't slip this time. Sometimes my camera could be a That looks good. What do you think, guys? It's beautiful. I just, I just honestly think, you know, maybe we should do decals on here, right here. And then the decals, we could cut it, and then that would protect this, this seam so it doesn't look like death in like three days. So that is freaking gorgeous, guys. I love it. It's gonna be so cool to watch this thing taxiing around for four minutes at a time. A lot can happen in four minutes. Okay, next step. We are going to assemble the vortex generators. Earlier, in an earlier video, earlier, in this earlier video, I was complaining about how these vortex generators were kind of like hokey looking. I stand by my assessment. However, <laughs> Uh, the thing that's nice about these being rounded is that when you stick this wing on the carpet of your vehicle, it's not going to catch and like rip off your wing. So just be aware. And um, again, seriously, Horizon, you couldn't have peeled the backing off and applied it to this? No. Exactly. That costs extra. They couldn't. They could not. That would have cost them like $4 in Chinese labor for the entire batch they ordered. Yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the wings. Let's get them laid out and we'll come right back. Okay. All right, folks, these are vortex generators. Okay, VGs, if you prefer. 
Uh, there's a piece of double-sided tape I applied here prior to our video starting, and I want to show you a problem. See this? It's too long. So um, I could probably stick this in like that and let it snap down, but I would rather in this occasion just trim off, I don't know, like a millimeter on each side. I don't really know why I'm having to trim these things, but it's not a big deal. It's not hard or anything. I'm not sure okay with that. <laughs> See? Ready? So I'm just following the groove here. And I'm just... Man, that's not too bad. But it's not, not fitting perfect. That's a little bit annoying. What do you think, hon? Pretty annoying, right? I... My wife is pissed. Super. You can tell. Right. She's really irritated. <laughs> really, really annoyed. Um, okay, so you'll notice that they're pointed like this. So the tip is coming up here. So it's going to go like this. And then off the tip of that, it's going to make a small vortex, which is going to go across the wing surface. And no, for those of you that aren't airplane aficionados, it isn't fake. It actually is a real thing. Yes, it is a real thing. I didn't accuse it of not being a real thing. I have for my real plane, you know. Oh, I've still never seen your real plane. You haven't seen my real plane? No. Have you seen YouTube? <laughs> well, yeah, but not in real life. So, another tip. Roll those up when you're done because otherwise you're going to constantly <laughs> confuse them with the other ones because they look exactly the same when they're peeled as they do when they're um, a complete piece. So we're just gonna we're just gonna work this. It's it's really not rocket science. I mostly just wanted you guys to see that that it's not hard to put them on, um, and then they are equal on the original Carbon Z Cub. People complained, and I don't know if it was because they were like really dumb or if they had problems where like there was one, two, three, four, five on this one, and then there was like one, two, three, four, five, six on the next one. They cut mm. these even, so. As a precautionary measure, I'm gonna trim just a little teeny bit off of each of these sides, just so that I know for sure it'll fit without having to crush the foam. Um, you, you don't have to do this, but it's just, I don't wanna fight it. Once you get that double-sided tape, it's, it's wanting to go down there. So we're gonna, we're gonna finish this project. You'll notice that I'm sitting uh, so I can be comfortable. Thanks. So if you don't like that, just fast forward past my sitting been working all day I'm tired I've been sitting in a truck driving mm -hmm. me too not that though oh yeah I guess my wife was working too so I did have pretty good luck applying this double-sided tape uh, to the wing I did not bother with trying to take off any of this uh, paint if you were worried about it you could do that certainly but I'm gonna be totally honest with you I just don't care that much it's really? not gonna be an issue but yeah, there's people that'll worry about it. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, seriously. Hey, they drive Honda Civics, Megan. I mean, camera crew. Let's not insult all of them at once. It's dangerous. trying to spread it out. <laughs> so, we have a knife. So once you get the edge down, then the super, super easy thing to do is to just peel the edge up. I mean, seriously, I didn't think it was going to be that easy. I thought it was going to be a huge thing. Yeah, I do. And what I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and apply this one here just so I have a, uh, a chance to test fit the, the other side. So I'm just going to ram that in there between the, the little lips. You see how that goes? Mm-hmm. Just ram it between the lips here. There's like a lip here and a, a lip there, so it's just ram it between them. I think we got it. Did you? I did. Okay, good. You're making it look harder than I think it actually is. Well, here's the thing. So I'm gonna slide this in here, and then we do have a little bit of play, guys. So my plan worked flawlessly. So, so about the time you put them like this, you, you're gonna, you know, you, this, the direction of airflow should be going like this, okay? If you put it like this, it's, it's gonna be counterproductive. You won't stall the wing early, it just won't work as vortex generators, okay? Or, I don't know, maybe it will. Maybe it'll work even better that way. See, no one's tried it. 
Everybody just kept following the directions. Yeah, they just kept following the directions in Chinglish. <laughs> Actually, Horizon does a good job. With yes, the directions. their directions are way De better. On decorations. I don't laugh very much when I read Horizon directions. No, I know. It's not like no flying near hospitals, railroad crossings, and schools. And what else? What else they usually do? They include parks. Parks, power lines, mm -hmm. tall buildings, houses, short buildings, grass, medium buildings, trees. People. People. Definitely Especially the people. people. Do not fly around people. No, never. But make sure that you have a manned aircraft. Okay? Yes. Seriously, guys. This is life, life or death. Life or death. Okay. And only if you're going to do some. This is not just a fun hobby. Okay. This is serious business. <laughs> you better take it serious. If you're smiling, just. Oh, man. The FA is going <laughs> to get you. Okay. Here we go, guys. No smiling. No fun. No fun. Okay. Here we go. Right here. Just ram it between the lips like before. Here we go. Oh, yeah. It's surprisingly a bad fit. Don't you think? Really? Yeah. Like, it's... Why Why do I have to crush it? You know? It's like these lips should just open right up and just let it right in. Well, sometimes you kind of have to work it a little bit. You have to work it for a while. Mm hmm Okay, guys. So, you'll notice that my, my plan did not fail miserably. I'm not calling that a failure. I'd rather have an opening than have that you know, like way over the edge yeah. and causing a bump. Cause that bump will be the first thing to come off. So vortex generators, that looks pretty cool. Hey, get the little chunk of styrofoam off there that looks like it's dented. Here, show them from this side. Oh, that is so gorgeous. Looks really good, guys. Cool. In real life, vortex generators would be like pretty small compared to these. Like they're only incrementally larger than that on a real plane. So, hmm. um, because the air molecules are the same size. So we got to finish the framework under here. Uh, we'll do the vortex generators on the other wing first, just so we can get everything assembled at once and we'll come right back. Okay guys, so we built one of them. It was awkward. There was one sack that was labeled wrong and then there's a whole new nut sack. So just be careful. The instructions are really confusing. Like open bag L and take out bolt E. Mm -hmm. And then, like, later in the phrase, they're like, open bag E and take out bolt J. And you're like, what are you thinking, Horizon? So, anyway, super annoying. So, we'll just show you how this works. It's not really hard. It's just you have to be mindful that the F bolts are shorter than the J bolts. The J bolts are the ones that go out here because it's wider. And the F bolts are the ones that go here. Unless, of course, they mismark the one that you get. Um, keep in mind also, you don't want to tighten these so that they can't move easily. I actually have them so that they're like sort of loose. And to be honest, I'd like them maybe tighten a little bit more, but see, these are F. So notice that this fits inside and then it's just a nice fit. Okay. Just like that. And then this is going to be allowed to pivot once you put the nuts on from your nut sack. So just grab your nut sack, get out the number of nuts you need, which is gonna be two for this and then two more for out here on the longer J bolts, okay? So I'll just show you how I did this because this worked out pretty decent uh, by hand. Getting them started like this. See, I said how easy it worked and now mm -hmm. I'm jinxing myself. Okay, so we just get that started. And then what I found was like this crescent wrench, I just kind of laid it down. And then its its own weight was enough to allow me to do this without dimpling the foam too bad. So that worked out much easier than some of my other efforts. Now watch, I'm gonna go to where it's tight. Toy, look at toy, go. See? And then I back it off just a wee bit. Just a wee bit. Now I'm gonna take that and you'll notice it's smooth and there's no damage. Did you like that camera crew? Mm-hmm. So we'll just replicate that on this side and uh, then we can go on to the next ones. So guys, this plane, I, I gotta say is 
there's a lot of steps to it. It's not like a lot of hard steps. I mean, there's been some pretty hard steps, but just not on camera. Um, so in this case, what I would recommend you do is just drink a lot of water and take breaks because you don't want to get dehydrated. <laughs> this is, this, this plane has got a lot of steps and you'll be like, why do I have to do all these steps? It, you know, so I'm just thinking back to the EC 1500 guys. I'm just thinking back like that plane was really relatively easy to put together but it was relatively hard to get adjusted to fly well and then it kind of flew crappy at first mostly because i made some mistakes and then um it was way out of trim out of box something that's not customary for a horizon hobby product so i'm really expecting this to do well and this plane is way way lighter um not necessarily way lighter in general i think it might actually be heavier but it's a lot bigger wing and so i'm really excited to see how well it flies i think it's going to fly excellent um and i'm going to be extremely disappointed if it doesn't because two expensive planes in a row there will be a strongly worded email except i'm not going to email i'm going to call them and complain and beg for another plane that's going to disappoint and they won't do it so that's what's gonna happen, guys. Now you know the you know my end game. Unless Verizon, if you're watching, you didn't hear any of that. <laughs> okay, so we got the J bolts here, and the J bolts. I'm gonna show you how I did this, guys. These are the same on left and right. Just remember the the bent part goes toward the fuse. Okay, it'll be obvious because you can't put it in wrong. And then when you set this up, it goes on the outside, respectively, okay? And those are not bolts, those are a different mechanism. So what I was gonna suggest is then also take this and just get it dry fit. We were talking about this off camera, okay? So this is a scale plane, right? So why did Horizon leave the hollow down? Cause you see that, okay? I mean, to be honest with you, it shouldn't be hollow like that in my opinion. Um, it's, it's to save on weight and I understand that, but like guys, really like you're going to make it so you can see the hollow. So, I mean, but let's get real. I mean, you see the servos and stuff. So it's probably not a big deal. Um, but just my two cents worth, uh, in the matter. So we're going to do the exact same thing we did on the other side. And it is a pretty exceptionally boring process. Uh, tightening all these bolts. I cannot imagine doing this every time you go to the field, but you don't have to do this every time you go to the field. And I'll show you why it's pretty evident if you haven't already figured it out. What's going to happen is you basically have this set up to where you can collapse these down so you can get them in your Honda Civic. Oh, um, yeah. That's why they did If that. you drive a Honda Civic. See, they were thinking. They were thinking about you Honda Civic mm -hmm, drivers. They were. Truthfully, I don't even know if you can get this through the door in a Honda Civic. I'm you may have to actually just cut the, you know, Top like get the, the jaws off. off. Just mm -hmm. call the fire department and be like, hey, you guys, you guys saving your lives right now. Could you help me uh, cut the, uh, to the, the A-frame on my Honda Civic or, mm -hmm. you know, I just need, I need to get an airplane in there. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, we'll head on out. Sure, no big we deal. We'll come to you. You don't come down to the fire station. <laughs> so um, on second thought, maybe you should not do that because <laughs> I could see somebody doing that. Maybe like, yeah, don't, mm -hmm. don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. It's not a good idea. Just like don't interfere with firefighting operations with your drones. Like, like that probably happened once, you know. But now it's a rule. So we all know yep. that drones are exactly like airplanes. We all need more rules in yeah, our life. Yeah, we need some more rules. So the federal Can government is can't even stop telemarketers from calling my phone fifteen times a day. <laughs> but I trust them to run the rest of my life. <laughs> So anyway, on that high note, uh, you'll notice I've been really jacking around with my nuts here. And uh, it's getting kind of old to do, you know, I mean, this is, <laughs> I feel like I've done this 30 times on this plane. And to be honest with you, I, I probably have. Um, but I'll be honest, night locks are nice. They don't come loose. You don't have to worry about putting Loctite on. Okay, so I want, I promised I'd show you this. 
So you see this here? Yep. It's moving free, which is nice. Put them on the outside. And then basically you use these. These mine are in the K bag. It was supposed to be the L, L bag. But what I'll do is I'll just show you this real quick. So we got those things, which are really nice. But um, what I'm gonna fill these out because it's really hard to get the little clips out. And I don't know if they gave us extras or if I just, uh, I think you might use those on the other half as well. Maybe so. So you see you got one clip and you got one of these uh, shafts. I don't know what they call those things. Pins? Camera crew, could you hold up one side of those, please? Yep. For fear of your wonderful counterpart looking like a fool. Mm -hmm. I do that on my own. <laughs> okay, so once you get that in there, then you can slide the pin in. Yes, um, per the directions, the pins are supposed to go in the middle. I, it doesn't matter, though. You can do it whichever way you want. Um... We'll do that, and then this pin will go in. I am trying to do them all the same way. Did I do it the same way? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there you have it, guys. So that's so that's why you leave them wiggly jiggly. Because then you can collapse this. You'll also notice I bent, I, I didn't bend. I, I carefully moved the aileron servo so that I had room to get the, the screw in there. So our next step is gonna be to probably stick these on the plane, so we'll come right back when we get reset. All right guys, so we're back. We're gonna go ahead and assemble the wings. You have to grab this gigantic long black shaft and just slip it on in. Let's see how this works, guys. Wow, that actually was way smoother than I figured it would be. I've had some problems when I try to ram black shafts and things. Usually the carbon fiber shafts like that will get stuck. All joking aside. Okay, so this is of course, longer than my ruler is marked. That's the so worst I'm ruler. Hold, I'm just gonna hold it with my my thumb so I know how far it's penetrating. So it looks like we need to penetrate about maybe like 11 and three quarters inches on each side. And when I say 11 and three quarters, that's where it's stopping. So I'm gonna go 11 and five eighths because there's actually a part of this. This ruler's stupid. It's the it dumbest ruler ever. It's the dumbest ruler ever because it doesn't start at zero. So that's gonna be, yeah, that's close enough. It's, it does help to get them centered first, you'll find. Uh, the reason I also have the ruler out is so we can mark the center of gravity. So the center of gravity um, is gonna be marked at, I marked the manual. I don't know if I mentioned this in the videos, but 4,000 milliamp 6S is what they recommend for this plane. 105 to 120 millimeters back from the leading edge at the wing root. Okay, so 105 to 120 millimeters back. So we're gonna use this, and we're gonna use an ultra fine Sharpie, if I can find one. So we can't find an ultra fine, so we'll just use uh, a black one. Goodness gracious, Give me my nice black markers. Give me a grab Here's one. one. Okay. Except that's crappy. Too. I don't know where they went. Well, we had a million of them, and then we must have like used them on airplanes. Mm. So here's a good one. I can't imagine that happening. So the reason we're going to mark with a fine tip is because I want to mark... That was not very fine either. <laughs> we're going to go 105, and then we're going to go at 120. So from the, the wing root, so you wanna just think about it like this. You gotta kinda use almost like a straight edge to start your measurement. So I'm just gonna drop this down square and then I can measure back. So we wanna go 105 to 120. So 105 would be 10.5 and then make a dot. And I'll just make a dot there and then 120, which would be there. So there's our other mark. And see, the nice thing about a metal ruler is you can just mark the ruler, and you can transpose that really easy. So there's 10, 20, 30, 40, 105, and then 120, okay? So we'll just transpose that on both sides. But you can see my easy mark. And 
And so I'm just laying that flat and then I'm just putting this on the edge of the, the edge of the plane uh, wing. And then I can kind of get a square starting point. And then from there I can come in here and mark my two dots. And remember, we have a pretty, pretty big range for the center of gravity on this. So uh, I think this plane is gonna end up flying a little bit, um, I don't wanna say indifferent, but somewhat indifferent of center of gravity within reason because the battery holder is gonna help us to get good results. That is one of the big upgrades on this plane is the battery holder. So now that that's marked, we can put these markers away. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna actually slide those wings on. So obviously we have to physically install these, but we have to hook up the wires, okay? So if you wanna give them a, just a quick view of this, if you just gently pull these out, there's a flap and aileron servo plug, okay? And then there's a, a plug to receive them. So usually the easiest way to do this is you put the wing on a little bit. You slide it on the black shaft a little bit. And then you just grab and go ahead and terminate your leads. I would highly recommend being super careful to plug these in. Um, I'm not going to glue these because it isn't impossible that I would pull the wings off of this plane again because it's such a huge plane. Okay, so we've got that one plugged in. And then what I wanna do is I wanna allow this to slide back into that cavity. Okay, so they kinda gotta more or less be in line. And then as you walk it back, you'll just uh, put the slack right in the wing. Okay. Remember guys, even though you want all the control surfaces you can get, this plane will fly. Ooh, look at that, mm. that sucks the big one. See that? Yep. That is so frustrating, guys. That finish just got peeled. So I'm gonna just push that down and hope we don't have any worse. Ugh, so annoying. And there's not anything you can really do about that. That's pretty frustrating. It's not gonna be that noticeable, so I'm not super worried about it. And now we'll go ahead and slide on this other side. This thing is huge. Um, yeah. It's awesome though. I'm gonna have to like build a garage for it. So the brown goes back on this flat plug, but I don't think that's a standard. I just think that's the way it happened to work out. Because that holder can hold either one. Did I get the aileron and flap plugged into the right spots on the other side? I couldn't read the other. I'll slide it out real quick here in a second. Okay, so I got good purchase mm -hmm. there. And then I'm just going to slip these in as I go. See, it's really, it's pretty easy. There's a lot of room in there for the wires. A very well designed wing. I mean, the newer ones are nicer because you don't have to deal with connecting them this way, you just like literally slip them in. And that's pretty cool. Okay. So now you got to pretty much support over here on the opposite side of the fuse and then walk it in. That's way better than on the EC1500, uh, 100 times better. So now that we've got that in there, my inclination is to put in the thumb bolts, okay? Okay, so that was like a thousand times easier than the yeah, EC1500. Do you remember how long sure. I fought that? Yes, that was ridiculous. It was totally ridiculous. I mean, I spent like two minutes just trying to get one of the screws to line up. Yeah. This thing is clearly lined up. It is a toolless install, which is really nice, guys. Um, and I mean an actual truly toolless install. So you could use a flat bladed screwdriver if you want. Like for me, I'm a little bit inclined to maybe get a bolt that I can put in here that's just gonna, you know, just be a bolt. Um, the only problem with that is that this decorative antenna mm -hmm. is gonna actually go on top. Uh, but I, I'm not really hip to having this thing sticking out like that. So I wanna make sure I get it square so it's in line, it doesn't create a bunch of extra drag. 
that'd be a drag. Totally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so remember how I was talking about once you have the weight of the wings, it's going to be a little more squishy. It's already it's already more flexible feeling. Mm -hmm. Meaning the landing gear are um, designed to have the weight of the wings, obviously, on them, which makes sense because there's going to be wings on an airplane. Okay, let's see if we get lucky again. I got to say, of all the Horizon planes I've had, these bolts have lined up probably the easiest of every plane I've ever built. And I've built quite a few Horizon planes. Yeah. I've had a lot where I struggled to get lined up here. This has been a daydream, putting those together. Mm -hmm. Now granted, that's the expectation is that you're going to be assembling this at the field because it's such a big plane. Well, in my case, my field is right there. So I don't necessarily have to transport it, but if I want to transport it, then I can, which is pretty cool. And like, if I was going to transport this in my car, I'd probably take one wing off. And then I would, of course, leave the tailplane on. I would leave the horizontal stabilizer on. Okay, so that one's needing to be pulled in a little bit. And there you go. So, I mean, that was super easy, guys. Like, really, really easy. I'm not sure how you're gonna get this, like, out of the house. Oh yeah, we're gonna open the door. So this is 84 inches wide on the widest part, okay? So you can run this through the doorway vertically without any problem. That's through true. a regular man door. A normal door is seven foot six in North America. We have an eight foot tall front door. So we also have an eight foot wide slider. So like about half of that is gonna open up. Um, it's eight foot tall and eight foot wide. But yes. Only half of it slides. Then downstairs we have a seven, seven, six slider. Okay, so let's see if this snaps on like expected. Hmm, a little bit resistant to snapping on. I'm not sure why, or if I've done something wrong maybe. Can you tell from that angle? Camera? No. Does it just snap? Yeah, it just snaps. Mm. I'll, try, I'll just try the other side. Maybe I just have an alignment issue. Huh. Hmm. I don't know. That tells like pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. But this one's kind of cocked to the side a little bit. There we go. Now that's straight. I love the antennas. I'm not real, I don't feel really secure about those. Okay, so now we're going to take these little things. And uh, they were in the mislabeled bag. And I'm just going to look at my drawing here and see which way they go. Because honestly, I can't tell. Oh, they go from the top down. And it looks like this control, this thing goes underneath. Yep. On both of them. Wow, that's going to be like hard to do that. See that? It Jimmy. wants to like fall out. Jimmy. That's pretty annoying. See that? It wants to like fall out. Jimmy, come around and help. I don't like that at all. I wish that that was on top so it didn't have a propensity to want to fall out. Because then all your, see the problem I, I, I have with this design is that you're dependent on the pin to be in place to absolutely hold it. I'd rather have the point of failure be something else than the pin. So, but that's definitively what the drawing shows. And that's what the picture on the box. Yeah, well, we're gonna just do it the way the box shows and the way the instruction manual shows for now. But as you can see, my I mean, you are dependent on the pin right now. So if this pin were to pop out, then, um, but you gotta remember, you're, you're kind of inverse of what you're gonna be doing during flight right here in this condition because you're on the ground. There's no load. Normally you're gonna lift up from out here on the end of the wing. So that lifting is going to pull up the aircraft. It's going to lift up the fuse. And in a real airplane, this would be picking up where there's like a pilot sitting. So there'd be a lot of weight concentrated there. And then the fuel from the aircraft and all that good stuff. Actually, the fuel on the aircraft would be inside of the wing here on one of these planes, if I am correct. So basically, you're going to have to get both of those in there. They do hold. Just keep in mind that when you're... Can you uh, lower down the camera so they can see this? So when you're lifting on the wing, you're going to want to lift this up and pull it out, okay? So meaning that when it's flying, it's going to pull up like this.
but when it's sitting on the on the taxiway or in your driveway or in the air airfield or whatever it's pushing down so these the the point of failure is what i'm getting at is is this pin is going to be under uh stress this way not this way right now when it's not flying it's pushing down so i hope that makes sense to you guys but anyway um I'm gonna put these other two in, and then technically I believe this plane is assembled at that point. And then we're just left to do radio setup, which is gonna be the next part of the video. Um, wowzers, that popped right out, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking this would probably not be like super duper fun out in the, you know, like in the grass. No. But, I mean, it's, it is technically toolless, but I'm on an island in the kitchen. I can like kneel down on a hardwood floor that's clean. It's just doing this out in the field, maybe not going to be quite so easy. There's like flights and. Stuff. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so the other thing is this thing, and you definitely got some weight from those wings. It's surprising, like all this stuff you would think it's fairly light and in, a, in and of itself proportionate to the aircraft it's pretty light but um it's still still got a little bit of weight to it there it is oh my goodness what a pain so luckily for me i don't have to necessarily take it apart um let's see how heavy it is oh jeez it's heavy it's weird to have such a heavy aircraft so I'm six foot one, plus or minus an inch. <laughs> so if I'm six foot one, it's taller than me, right? Yep. Oh yeah. So but you can get through our front door for sure. And uh, I'm not saying it's going to be especially easy to do that, but you can definitely do it. Uh, the next step, guys, is going to be, well, is it taller than our faucet? Yeah, I know uh, there's a reason I needed a plane this big. <laughs> so the next step in this video series, and when I say video series, I mean it's all going to be one big, gigantic, long video, is going to be to set up the radio setup. We are not doing the advanced setup where the, there's a, a selectable switch for flaps and ailerons to act together, meaning these would act as an aileron and less flipped to switch uh, for flap setting. I'm not gonna do that because I don't intend to use it that way. Um, maybe after I play with it for a little bit, I will do that. That requires opening this up and taking off a Y splitter on the flap channel and adding a few mixes. So I can go over that later if I don't like the way it flies, but I have a sneaky suspicion it's going to fly good out of the box and it is beautiful. If you wanna give them a shot from the other angles real quick before we move on. And I really, even though it took a while, guys, it, it went together nicely. Um, and we haven't even really seen much about this plane in terms of its features and stuff. But let's show them inside of here too real quick. There's a bind plug, extension cord, which is really handy, okay? And if you need to get to this uh, radio, you can get back to the transmitter here, or the receiver here, rather, okay? So just to be clear, there is a snap that goes shine into here. See this? Mm -hmm. You can lift this, and then the battery tray is allowed to pop out. Mm. That is a big deal, and there are feet. Okay. There's certain spots where the battery is designed to fit. And the thing I love about this is that you can get your battery in without having to try to stick your hand in here. That was one of the big complaints that people had. And there was actually a few aftermarket choices that you could purchase. And of course, they, they weren't cheap. That was like a lot of money, actually. And the landing gear were a lot of money. You could spend three to four hundred dollars on just the aftermarket landing gear. That's crazy. So you were talking, you know, almost a thousand bucks into a, a carbon Z Cub, um, the blue one, the original one. There is an on-off switch in here too, by the way, guys. This has a pretty big prop on it. On-off. 
So don't forget there's an on off switch. That's important to remember because when you first plug in your battery and all you hear is the ESC chime um, or you hear nothing, you might freak out and be like, what did I do wrong? I don't think you did anything wrong. It's just, you know, you gotta make sure you get that done. So that all being understood guys, our next video is gonna be radio setup. And uh, do you wanna show them how this locks in real quick before we move on? So this thing is allowed to slip into different positions and basically um, you push it down and then it clips. Then you push that and it, it, it catches. And then your battery is secured. So very exciting. I really like the way it looks. Um, the only thing I honestly, out of all the looks on this plane that I don't like is this chintzy looking nose cone. And then also this, this would normally be a different color. So I don't know if that's actually supposed to be that color or if it's supposed to be black. Cause I think that's supposed to be carbon, carbon fiber usually. And there are some included decals that come with this. They come with these uh, fake lights that you can put onto the wing if you'd like to do so. I don't think I'm gonna do that because I'm gonna put real lights on this eventually. And then it comes with your standard uh, Spectrum E-Flight stuff like this if you wanna add some decals. Of course, it's got the safe and it's got the Carbon Cub SS. I probably will add the Carbon Cub SS. But I don't exactly know where that's supposed to go. I think it's supposed to go up, yeah. The mm -hmm. It's supposed to go here. We'll add that real quick because it's part of the build. And then the rest of it, I'm not gonna probably bother with, but I do like the Carbon Cub SS because that is a uh, brand specific thing. And this is a Carbon Cub SS. So you can go get one of these planes for like, I don't know, probably in the $200,000 range. It's a lot of money for a small plane if you ask me, but that's gonna have all the bells and whistles in it. So Carbon Cub SS, I'm noticing because I can see it in the big picture. If you need to get into your motor later, what you'll do is you'll just take a knife and you'll literally cut along that seam. But this is gonna help to keep this from vibrating too. So I'm glad that we noticed that. Thank you, honey. Carbon Cub SS, that is pretty cool. And what does SS stand for? Oh, I feel like I should know it, but I don't. Sorry, I don't remember. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Make me look like an idiot. No, we'll look like idiots together. <laughs> I'm sure someone will. So those were super easy decals. It wasn't some stupid water release decal that I'm going to screw up and have a 45 minute video on how not <laughs> to install. Um, and then like that E-Flight is just gigantic and gaudy. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to put that on. Um, I think they're supposed to actually go on possibly the control surfaces is where people tend to do that. Mm. But I don't have any interest in advertising for them any more than I already do for free. So if you guys want me to stick those decals on, then you can stick it where the sun don't shine. On that high note, <laughs> we're going to continue this video series. I believe we're going to jump into radio setup. And if it's not radio setup next, then you may be watching the battery connector video. And that's super fun, mm -hmm. really exciting stuff. But it is necessary if you're not going to use the correct battery. If you use the correct batteries, which by the way, you're looking at a hundred bucks, then maybe you could watch my other videos about the Zop. Um, I have a playlist for this and every other plane. And uh, I have a playlist for non-plane videos. And that's where you're going to see stuff like batteries and adapters and different things like this. And how to build them and what types of things. This particular battery, I did a review on it the other day. Um, we'll see how it performs in this. We're not going to run it to zero. Um, but just since I know this battery, I'll probably start with this one and then we'll do that one also. But guys, that's it for now. Thank you for watching. If this happens to be the end of the video, I don't think it will be. We really appreciate you all. Channel's seen some good success and it's because of you guys, the viewers. It's not because of our awesome, hilarious jokes. <laughs> it's not because of our awesome... Uh, flying. It's not because of my wonderful looks. <laughs> it's because you guys come back for more. So we really appreciate you being part of this experience. We love flying. And when I say we, I mean me and not my wife. She tolerates flying. <laughs> so it's good. But thank you for being a part of it. And uh, if you want to buy one, check the description below. If you buy it, 
literally cents of your purchase will go into my back pocket at some point. And we appreciate that. It helps to support the channel and uh, all the different things we need $25,000 tractors that have nothing to do with us. Come back for more. Okay, YouTube, it's Brian Phillips back again. If you're still watching this, I'm not sure if you maybe have something more important to do. Now I'm going to go do that. But for now, we're going to just spend lots of time on this airplane. Uh, this lid thing on my Carbon Z Cub SS 2.1 meter did not come out. So I had to reach into the nose and then see, show them, camera crew. I had to push up on this thing to pop it out. This is a release mechanism here, okay? So as you can see, when you push, it releases. So there's this little keeper. So we'll demonstrate how it should work. Oh, fancy, pretty cool, right? So that's only cool if it works. And in my experience, it didn't work at first. Uh, so if you watch the unboxing, you'll notice that was the noise we were hearing, is that it wasn't, it wasn't declamping. Now in my experience, once you get it to work, it usually works okay. The other thing is, on the old ones, this paint would fray off and just kind of fray off. I don't know if that's even a word, but it would, it, would, it would break up over time. I'm not sure if I'm gonna mess with it. I might just touch up the paint when it does happen. You could also tape around the edges, but my experience is that the tape will for sure take the paint off. So if you do that, Best of luck to you. I hope that's a good choice for you. For me, I'm probably just gonna leave it as is for the moment and then hope for the best. Okay, so you press the release, it shoots the Okay, that brings us to the second topic of discussion. You may or may not see that in the manual. Now, the, the other thing I may do is I'll probably go ahead and put a little tail of tape here and that way when you release it, I can grab the tail and then I can help it along and pull that out very simply. So let's do that next. Um, we're gonna use just some regular tape. We'll install that right now. The regular tape is just regular clear scotch tape. I don't do anything fancy. This is gonna give you guys a quick preview of what we're gonna be looking at for the next step, but I'm just gonna put that on there, center it up, and see I'm just applying it so I get a good purchase on that. And then I'm gonna actually fold this down so that it folds flat and stays somewhat lifted. Okay, the way you do that is you point it the direction you want angularly, and then you pinch it. And then when you're done, that thing is mostly at the angle I wanted. Okay, so now, when you do press the release button, see, you've got a tail. You can pull it out. That will help to preserve the look of your plane a little bit, and it's not really hard to do. Now, you could do that all the way along, along the edges, and then you could trim it, or you could put it lengthwise around the edge. It's really not a big deal. Whatever suits your fancy is what you should do, but I would recommend doing that. I always do that on hatches. It's very easy, it works very effective. Okay, so now that leads me to the second problem I have, and that is this is the IC5 connector, which is the new EC5 connector. It's got this smart connection in the middle. You see the, the copper in the middle there? Mm -hmm. What that does is it allows the uh, smart part of this circuit to work. Of course, they don't have a smart ESC on this side. So the IC5 connector is irrelevant on this plane. It is not necessarily irrelevant from the battery perspective, but a little point of contention, the last adapter I made to receive an XT60, which yes, I know some of you are thinking, EC5, EC5 needs more, no, it's not gonna be enough amps. Let me tell you something, they use just to be clear, guys, that is a 13-gauge wire, okay? 13-gauge wire does not substantiate an EC5. I'm sorry to disagree with you, but it doesn't. So I'm not even worried about using an, an, an XT60. However, I'm not going to put an XT60 on here. I'm going to leave the factory plug on this plane for the moment, and I'll show you why. I made a mistake on this connector. It was supposed to be an adapter. This is an EC5, it's the female variety, the one that would have been in the plane that would receive a battery. So pretty useless adapter, sorry about that folks. I have thought this one through a little bit more and I'll show you what my thoughts are right now. This is gonna be our first step. I have Turner G Heavy Duty 6S 4000 milliamp packs, also known as four amps, on each of the cells that are in series, okay? 
This is the connector. It's called an HXT four millimeter. It is a four millimeter bolt plug on both sides. This is a pin, that's a socket. I'll demonstrate in a minute. I wanna be able to plug this into that. Obviously it's not gonna work, so we have to make an adapter. I also have, um, and that's a Turning G Heavy Duty 60C, 60 through 120C, okay? This is a Zop Power, the Chinese brand. It's got an XT60. Uh, notice that it has a 10 gauge wire on it. Horizon, if you're listening, 10 gauge, Chinese brand, really? 13 gauge, $450 plane, seriously. So anyway, just to bring that out, the XT60 is more than capable of supporting that. Now, if you're gonna like take and short this out with a resistor, like a one ohm resistor, then yeah, you're gonna have problems with a, a 10 aug wire anyway. So you might as well just go ahead and plug it out. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna build two adapters, one of which is gonna be an XT60 of the female variety, even though it's not a female because it's got pins, so it's very confusing these days. <laughs> um, we are gonna build that to receive the plug like that, and then it's gonna be this type of EC5 plug, which will plug into the IX. Can you come over here, camera crew? Yeah. This slides in, okay? Now, see how there's pins in here? These pins will receive a socketed connection that will be inside of these, okay? So we'll show you that now over here. Here's the socket, guys. This is a socket. This socket will be inside of this connector. It's gonna snap in when we're done soldering which is part of the reason why I don't like EC5 connections, but still, look, that goes around here, okay? So it slides in and out, okay? And that is how that works. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build those now. I've laid all this out because it gets confusing and it is easy to make a mistake, so you don't wanna make a mistake. And so that's why I laid it out as such. I have some 10 gauge wire, okay? This is red, 10 gauge black. The part number, if you're looking for Hobby King part numbers, is a 9671, 9671 here. And then this is the other one, which is, uh, I don't know. It's 10 gauge black wire. You just look on the wire part of Hobby King if you really want to find it. Um, I did not link to this stuff because it's ridiculously easy to find. You can find whatever brand you want. Silicone on the outside is good. Um, and then as many multi-strands as you can get. Don't use a solid core wire that you got out of your Romex when you were finishing your basement, okay? It would actually conduct a lot of current through it, but it's, it's gonna give you all sorts of other problems. You need some flexibility, especially on an adapter. Okay, so that being said, we're gonna make these adapters approximately the same length. Um, I like to leave a little bit of room for heat shrink, but because all of these connectors are slide in, once we're done building, we can slide the heat shrink over the top if we need it, okay? So we'll slip them in on one side, we'll see if we need it, then we'll slide it over the opposite side before we snap these rings in. You see there's a little bit of a lip here, okay? That lip will snap into this. You will not get it back out. That's how you're allowed to pull the plugs in and out. So we're gonna cut two of these. They're gonna be relatively short, okay? There's one, and then here's two. Remember, the whole rationale behind doing this is so that I can use either style of battery that I currently possess or the one with an IC5, okay? Also known as an EC5, okay? The reason I like doing that is because then I have flexibility when I'm out flying. And if somebody's like, hey, I've got a battery, do you wanna use this battery to fly that one more time? I can be like, yeah, let's do that. Instead of, you know, like Esteban, like, oh, Brian, I forgot. Esteban is a cameo that appears in my videos a lot. He's my buddy, my flying buddy. But he does tend to forget things virtually every single time we get together. It's, it's okay though. Sorry, Esteban. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna now strip these leads. Uh, it's very simple. You can use strippers, but as you can see, these Craftsman strippers, they don't have quite the big enough, um, big enough opening to actually just do it the easy way. So you can do that or you can use scissors. 
or you can use a knife. The knife is probably the easiest way with silicone because you need to have a sharp knife. If you don't have a sharp knife, it's dangerous. You'll probably end up chopping your hands off. Just don't do that, okay? Um, or if you happen to chop your hands off, please don't blame me because I warned you now. Okay, so you've exposed a pretty good amount of this stuff. As you can see, that is gonna fit in there just gloriously. Look at this, oh wow. Ooh, that's good. So, a little bit too much actually. One way or another, we are gonna strip both ends of that, okay? So we'll use this, and we'll take just a slightly smaller bite on this side. Okay, just riding that in there gently. And then this is this is Terma G brand, if you didn't already figure that out from the Hobby King um, mentioned earlier. And you'll notice that that kind of cut at an angle, but that's okay, because look how this is gonna work. It's gonna line up nicely. And whichever side's gonna give me the better fit, looks like I can actually do this one with a little better penetration. You always wanna get as much penetration as you can. And um, yeah, so that 10 gauge just barely gets in there. Just to be clear, folks, 10 gauge is not commonly used on XT60s. In case you didn't already know that, um, it's pretty uncommon to use a 10 gauge on an XT60. And for good reason, because a 60 amp, uh, these are rated for like a 60 amp circuit, generally speaking, with bursts up to 1 trillion for an unknown amount of time. So, that was just a joke. That was a hobby king joke. We're gonna go ahead and put this in here now, guys. There's a lot of strands to try to try to get slid in there, and you'll notice what I'm doing. You're gonna have to scooch off my shoulder just a hair because I'm gonna bump you. See how I'm just working it in there, guys? See how many of those strands ended up outside of there? That is unfortunate. It's gonna be a little bit challenging to do this with this big of a wire. Maybe my camera crew could come over from my right side so that it's not gonna be as hard for her to film. See, because even if I try to ram this in, I'm not gonna get it in all the way. And that's okay. I'm probably not gonna get 100% purchase. That's okay. So we're gonna start by just doing, we're gonna start by doing the bare minimum. Now, one other thing you guys might run into is when you're doing this, you might find that it's easy to use a female and a male connector in combination to help dissipate the heat because the heat will get pretty intense as you do this, okay? So I'm gonna just grab one of these unused XT60 ends, which would be like the other predecessor here or the other half of this equation that will help us to control the heat, okay? We're doing the negative side. It's a little easier to see on the orange or yellow colored one. And then the positive is here. But that seam, that, that seam lengthwise makes that almost look like a plus. So you need to be careful when you're doing that with XT60s. If in doubt, grab your battery and make sure that you're in agreement, okay? Okay, see the negative is up here and that's a black wire. So we're good. Okay, so now I'm gonna have to probably solder the tip of this so that it can be not so unwieldy. I'm gonna get just a little bit of solder or excuse me, a little bit of flux on there. I should have said that correct. And um, we've got that flux, we'll clean the tip. And then what we're gonna do is we are going to, well, that was interesting. Then we're gonna grab our solder. And we'll go ahead and get a little bit of solder working into this material. We're gonna let it wick just a little bit in and that'll help tame the tip of that wire as we try to get it into the XT60. Just remember, you don't wanna to go too crazy. Now notice what I just did while it was hot. I dipped it into the flux. That is a fluxing good idea. My camera crew didn't like that joke. She thought it was vulgar. Um, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these forceps, also known as hemostats, and we are gonna grab onto the side that we're working so we can keep it straight. We're gonna clip it on and we're gonna set it like that. And remember, this is a 10 gauge wire, meaning that it's gonna conduct a lot of current. It's gonna, it's gonna have almost no resistance. So it's very hot when you do this. 
Okay, so I need a little bit of flux. I need a little bit of flux to be in this connector. Okay, I'm gonna heat it up, let that flux flow, that flux and flux flow. And we're gonna get this up against there, get it warmed up just a hair. And then we're gonna work this. And as you can see, we're having a little bit of trouble getting that to walk in there, guys. That's because it's huge. Huge. Get in there. Once I get that thing in there, it's going to be golden. But I got to put something on here heavy to keep it from slipping. So what better than a lithium polymer battery? That would be otherwise explosive. <laughs> so we always use explosives for our uh, counterweights while doing soldering. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We're having trouble getting this thing in here, which is like normal. Um, every time I do one of these adapter videos, it's a huge pain in the butt. And I'll be honest with you, I've built a million of these adapters and it's always worse on camera because I'm trying to start and stop for stupid reasons that don't even have anything to do with building an adapter. And it's a little bit harder for me to get these things built quick and they're very hot. That's one thing you'll find out about doing these when you do on a, like a 10 gauge wire like this, it's extremely hot. And you'll see a lot of guys that are like, oh, let's use helping hands. Well, the problem with helping hands is that they will help you melt through the wire and then you're screwed. But part of my problem is I, I have so much heat built up now because of the un, unknown distraction that I'm now fighting against all these variables that wouldn't normally be fought against. So I'm heating this thing up as much as I can quickly. And then I'm getting in here and I've got all this, you see that black stuff building up? I don't know if you can see that on camera, but that stuff is just all the debris and, and oh, it's falling off now. Like I said, it's always awkward doing this on camera. It's especially worse than it is in real life. In real life, it sucks. On camera, it's horrible. But there you go. So we've got that clamped. We're just gonna try again until we get it. We're gonna actually go to the other side. We're gonna see if we can use, oh, that is so hot I can barely touch it. I have used gloves in the past. I don't know if I'm gonna do that tonight. I'm probably gonna just try it like this. At first, we'll go ahead and hold it with this pair of pliers. If you'll notice, I'm dipping it into the flux and I just need it to hold. I don't need it to be perfect right offhand. Okay, so I've got this sort of holding now. Okay, so it's holding. Now the problem is I have to shift to getting the solder built into that joint. So I'm gonna to try to support it with this finger without getting burned. It's going to be a little bit challenging. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the solder let that hold. You notice my tip is really dirty, guys. Look at that. So the flux inside the solder is going to clean that tip a little bit. We see all that black stuff breaking off. I've always found the easiest way to get rid of it is to just tap it, but when you're doing a connector like this, it takes so much heat, you gotta have it hot. And I do not use um, anything to control the temperature. That's my own bad. If I use something to control the temperature and if I went a little quicker, this wouldn't be such an issue. See, that's what happens. So I'm just gonna actually put the solder there and I'm just gonna hold this and see if we can have better luck. If I have a couple stray strands, then I will work that here in a minute, which I do have like one down here. You probably can't see it on camera. Okay, so that is not a sufficient solder joint. It is soldered, but it is not soldered sufficiently to carry the type of current that I want this connector to carry, okay? So now the next step is, now that it's physically in place, it's got a little bit of solder holding it. Now I can switch gears to where I can get this thing to self-soothe to a degree, meaning it's not gonna fall out, okay? All right, so here we go. Remember, the more lead you put into this, the more strong it's gonna be electrically speaking, the more mechanically strong the joint is gonna be. 
but you are adding a lot of weight, okay? Remember, this is a pretty big plane. It can handle it. The types of planes that are gonna need an adapter like this should be able to handle it, okay? We get a nice big drop here, a drip rather. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heat and I'm gonna pull up and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it settle for a second, okay? And then I'll show you what I'm talking about, guys. See, there's a drip. See that drip? That's not a good thing. You don't want a big drip like that. This connector is pretty toasty right now. So now I'm gonna come back to the other side and this is just a little bit of a back and forth in my experience, yes, you may have had better experience than I, and that's fine. If you guys have better luck doing this than me, good for you. I'm glad you do. I do it a lot, but I don't do it as much as some people, and I don't have as good of a, a soldering iron as some folks do. So if you have a better soldering iron, you'll probably have an easier time with this. So clean tip. Okay, let that solder drip. Go to the other side. Good, now we should be able to get that heat shrinked later. That is an appropriate amount of solder. I'm satisfied with that. We will be able to conduct a lot of, a lot of electricity and heat. There is a lot of flux on that. That flux can be wiped off with acid, or not acid, with um, just regular, uh, what do we use? We use uh, medical... Acetone? Not no. acetone, well you could use acetone too, but that's not what I use. We use... Uh, Alcohol. alcohol, isopropyl alcohol mm. or medical alcohol. The medical alcohol is going to leave a little bit more residue, but it's a lot cheaper. Okay, so now we've got the positive terminal. So we didn't strip both sides this time. Uh, that wasn't by design, it was just kind of the way it worked out. So I'm going to try this a little bit different. I had so much trouble on that last one, I'm going to just try to stick this in the hole first, like I did there. And I'm just gonna do this the other way. This is the other way. I, I'm not a big fan of doing it this way, but we're gonna do it this way because it's just such a pain in the butt otherwise. I'm gonna get this flux nice and hot and I'm gonna take a little drip of it and I'm gonna stick it on there. I'm gonna stick it right there, okay? Now this is the other method that a lot of guys like to use. I'm not crazy about it because it still has all the same drawbacks, okay? I'm gonna heat the solder to get my tip. You need to get the solder on the tip so you can transmit the heat, okay, with the solder. That melted metal is what transmits the heat. Touch the flux, let it melt into the joint, let it pull the solder in, and then yes, you are actually getting a pretty good connection point this way. It's just that I've always felt like you're displacing all the areas where the solder should be going. And so I've always been reluctant to do it this way, but you can see that was a lot easier. Uh, is it done? Is that good enough? I honestly think it probably is. Um, but again, we are talking about a, a pretty important connection here. Now let's look at the other side so that the people at home can see why I'm concerned about that type of connection. You've got some unsoldered leads here. Okay. I'm about to rectify that. Clean the tip. Come in here. I got one wire, one wild wire that I just fixed. Now I'm just pushing this up against the connection here. Okay, now normally on an XT60, you would not want these wires out like this, but this is a 10 gauge wire, it's pretty big. Let's be honest guys, there's only so much you can do on these connections if you're trying to use a huge wire to a small wire, okay? But you'll notice when I go and do the other half, the half that's more by design, let's call it, um, you're gonna have, a lot of the same problems, so go figure. So now, now that that's soldered, you could sit and clean that stuff up. And when I say clean it up, I mean you'd physically clean that up with alcohol, okay? It's, it's still extremely hot, but it's not melted. You haven't had any deflection in this connector. The XT60 is still in good shape. And let's just be honest, guys, that is a lot more power than you're gonna have under normal circumstances from a battery discharge. If your pack, is getting this hot at the discharge leads, it's because you've caught it on fire. So if you've caught it on fire, this is not the weak link, okay? It's something else in the circuit. So you wanna resolve that. Okay, so now we're gonna strip this other side, probably 
Uh, may have been a little easier to do before I soldered it, but I thought that worked out pretty decent, so I'm okay with it. And all I'm doing is I'm just pushing until I feel the resistance of the wire. Keep in mind this is pretty hot, so when it comes off, it's going to be hot. The copper. This is the copper, okay? Or stainless steel or whatever it happens to be. In this case, I believe it's a copper-based product. Okay, so now let's look at our diagram again. Come back to that full circle. We've got our minus on that side, okay? And so these are both sockets. They're both female, okay? Connectors. So now let's go verify that 100% that when we get ready to stick this in the hole, it's gonna be correct. When I say stick this in the hole, I mean this hole is gonna stick onto that pin. Yep, it fits, and yep, it fits. Why am I quadruple checking this, people? Because I built it wrong last time and it was embarrassing. Actually, I don't even care about the embarrassment, I just care that I gotta build it again. <laughs> so, we're gonna do that right now. So this is our opportunity. Should we choose to do it, we can either slide the heat shrink on now or we can slide it on after we're done with this. I actually think I'm gonna cut that back because you can only go so deep with this connection. You see that? I can only go so deep. So there's no reason to have any more of that copper exposed, okay? But you have to be super careful not to get solder into this little joint right there. You will absolutely 100% regret it. So I'm gonna cut this. It's getting big enough to where it's almost hard to cut with the, the side cutters, but watch what happens when you cut them after there's solder in it. Look at that. Then you don't have this sort of crap happen, okay? I did that as a demonstration. I was pretty sure it was gonna happen. Usually you can get it after two or three cuts and if you're still having problems, if your wife is looking the other way, you can take a titanium pair of scissors and you can cut that little bit, okay? That will wear out your scissors, by the way, so I wouldn't recommend doing that a lot, especially with expensive scissors. A good pair of scissors costs more than those strippers, by the way. Okay, so that all being said, we're just gonna go ahead and drop this in here. We're gonna do it the easy way. The easy way means we are going to slip all these copper lines into the housing, which I did not get that time, so we have to try again until we do get it. And then we're gonna put flux on it, and then we are gonna put solder to it. Okay, see how that went in? Could you see that one? Mm -hmm. I think so. There's a couple of stragglers. I'm just going to fold those off to the side. You see how it's tipping up? I don't like that. I don't want that. But I also don't want to compromise what we do have in there. So I'm probably going to just push this down and see if I can hold it down somehow. Not working so hot, is it? Dang it. Okay, fine. So we got the flux. We're heating it up, cleaning the tip. We got a little bit of flux here. We're going to drip that flux right there on the wire, put that back into the flux bucket, and I'm just gonna solder the flux out of this. Now you'll notice at some point it's gonna tip over. You know why it's tipping over? Because the lead is heavy. And it's balancing. Okay, quite a bit of solder getting in there. Quite a bit of solder still going in there. You do not want to breathe this lead, leaded gas. Otherwise you'll end up like me and you don't want that. Okay, so that's soldered. We need to actually, believe it or not, a little bit more. Okay, I think we might be pretty close. Okay, good deal, I think that's it. Nope, there was still maybe a little bit, there was an air pocket in there because when I lifted it, it dripped out some. Okay, so we're good there. We're just gonna let that cool in that position. Guys, don't be afraid to hold these things in a different position if you wanna try to make for a stronger joint. Make the heat work to your advantage if you can. Okay, now I just have to sit here and wait for it to cool for a second so that it doesn't lop off because it's wanting to wiggle like this, okay. So that's on there now. 
And then we're gonna do the exact same thing on the other side, only this time it's going to be for the negative terminal. And yes, there's a lot of black on there. What we'll do is we'll get the alcohol ready after a minute here. And actually, while I do this other side, since you've already seen it, we'll pause it. My uh, camera crew will run and grab the alcohol so we can show you what it looks like once it's clean. And then you can make your own judgment based on what it looks like. So we'll come right back. Okay, so we got a Q-tip. This is 50% isopropyl alcohol, which is a little bit low for what we're doing, but it'll work. Just check out how much better these things look. You just get this alcohol, and you can put on a Q-tip. You're blocking the light there, camera crew. And then what you do is you just use this to clean the tips. And at the end of the day, you end up with less flux that's left because flux over time will potentially damage a connection um, is what I understand. I don't know if I necessarily buy that, but I'm gonna just kind of go with what I've been told because it seems believable because it is a cleaning agent. And you can see how it's just kind of looks a lot better. We don't quite have everything off of here, but like especially by these wires, by the edge of the wires, there's a lot of that brown stuff, that's flux. And the more you can get off of there, the better. It also will kind of cool things down a little bit if they're really hot. And that's another handy little bat, handy little bit. Okay, so you can see here we got a little bit more. So we'll probably just go to another clean one. And of course, if you can get away with using a little bit less flux, you'll have to clean it less. But then you end up with a clean connection and you don't have as much risk of having a, a failure later. So now our next step is gonna be to basically either slip the connector on or put heat shrink on. Since this is an XT60, um, we need to put some heat shrink on from this side. And then when we're ready to slide this in, I've got the labels all marked clearly. And so we can slip these in here and they'll snap in. So that will give us our connection from this ZOP battery directly into the uh, factory connection. Of course, we're not going to have the sensor. Uh, that would be part of the smart battery lineup. Uh, but I don't care because I'm never going to buy one of those unless somebody wants to give me some. So, but for now, we are going to get some heat shrink cup for this right now. Um, check out the part numbers if you're curious. If you want to look over here, please, camera crew. Here's the part number of what I'm using for black and red. Okay, you'll have to pause the video, folks. I'm not going to transpose that, and I'm not going to read it out loud, unfortunately, on this one. Um, so you want to just make sure that fits, and then cut off the respective amount. You'll notice that it's very tight, so we actually probably need to go up. Apologize. We will dig into the bag of goodies, which is basically a bunch of heat shrink, and we'll see if we can find a little bit bigger one and come right back. Okay, so I have a significantly less of this stuff. Um, it's a little bit bigger. I'm probably gonna need to get more of this style because it's kind of what we're using nowadays on these bigger and bigger planes. And as you can see, it just barely makes it over. The trouble is you run into the solder blip uh, bump like that, and you're gonna have a hard time getting over that. Um, there is a trick though, and I'll show you the trick now. I've got this one little piece that's already cut, and uh, we'll just see if we can get this for the video reasons. Uh, we'll just slide in there, open it up a little teeny bit. You don't wanna go too crazy because you can break that stuff, obviously. Just remember it's gonna relax when you put this, when you heat it, okay? You notice what I just did there, guys? Okay? So now we'll just slip that down, the length of the wire, um, until such a time as it's covering up the joint. And we want this to heat and then slide inside. So we'll be prepared for that in a minute, but for now we're just gonna do this. Uh, you guys are not gonna get a part number evidently, but this is uh, five millimeter five millimeter heat shrink, okay? It is a G brand, it's a Hobby King thing. If you decide you wanna buy some, then um, if you really wanna help support us and ask for the link, otherwise just go buy it because it's so minuscule, it's not even worth wasting your time. So there you go, so that's a little bit longer. I like my connections to look nice and neat. I know you guys probably don't believe that from the last video. 
So I'll go ahead and drop that down there. And then my next step is, of course, going to be to use a soldering iron, or excuse me, in my case, I'm going to use a lighter. It's just easier to control the temperature with a lighter, and we're going to heat shrink that down. So I'll just pull this out of the way. I want to start on the tip, just a little bit of heat to get it thinned up, and then I'm going to slip that in to that housing. You see how I did that? Now it's up in there, okay? And then I can just heat the rest of it and let it cinch down. And that's where that bulge of solder is gonna come in handy because that'll stop this heat shrink from slipping. Okay, then the same thing here. We're gonna get that ready to drop in there. Hit the tip of it only, let it shrink down just a little bit. We need a little bit more heat on this side, a little less on that. And I don't know if we're gonna get so lucky on that one, but you see how I'm just kind of forcing that down you can actually spin it a lot of times like I just did there. And then you see that little bump in there? If you heat it right, then you can kind of pull that out too. Okay, heat it again. Let it relax the heat shrink, okay? And then you can grab a little bit of alcohol on your fingers and it'll make your, it'll lubricate your fingers so that you can pull that little bump out of it, okay? Okay, so that's gonna basically stay put for us. Now, if we get lucky, this will snap on and it will cover our small, small dinky exposed amount, but I don't wanna risk it, so I am going to slip on two small pieces of heat shrink, which I will then cut off in mere moments um, if we find out that they weren't necessary. But I would rather have them on there now than get burned. And when I say burned, I don't mean like physically burned with a soldering iron, although I could see how you would think that. I mean, I don't want to be stuck with it. See, this one doesn't fit. So I'm going to take this. This must be a four millimeter size instead of a five. Open that up just a little bit so it's easy to get over. Slip it over, slide it down so it's prepared and ready. And then this one's sliding down so it's prepared and ready. And then I'm going to take this connector. If I didn't already talk about this, these come in kits. This is the Hobby King part number. They come with all the connectors too. So you've got your pins and your sockets. Okay, so that's that. And then the HXT four millimeters, that's your kit of 10 as well. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. They come with the male and female pins as well. Um, okay, so this is plus and that's minus. So what we're hoping is this will slip in and pop. I hate doing this step with a passion. I always have problems with this step. And I think, whoops. Mm, it's extremely hard to get these things in here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually heat up one connector, only one. Let me heat it up with fire, not with a soldering iron. I don't wanna overheat it, okay? Oh, good Lord. See, this is where if you're pushing hard, you actually break that, and then you're stuck with a broken connector. Um, we're gonna have to get a little bit hotter. We're gonna pause for just a second. So guys, what I did was I, was having trouble pushing that connector in like I did last time. And so I remember somebody gave me a tip to um, do it the other way like this, slide that through, and then try to pull it back on the other way. We're gonna see if that works right now. Hopefully it works. It's very hot still. If this doesn't work, all I've got to lose is just having to redo it. I'm surprised. So pull this, oh, that's totally it. So guys, for future reference, don't solder them first, solder them second. And look, we do have a good purchase. We have a good snap. Okay, that was my problem. So now we're gonna fix that on the other side too. So I'll show you how to fix that. Hopefully you're not following along too closely. <laughs> But that's part of the hobby, you know, learning by making mistakes repeatedly for years and teaching others how to make the same <laughs> mistakes.
repeatedly for years. That is what the hobby is all about. Repeatedly making mistakes for years. Okay, so I'm going to now, as you'll notice I've desoldered that, I'm going to now grab this, get a good purchase on it so it can help dissipate the heat. Then these are actually the vent tip ones, so I'm gonna get the flat forceps like this. And the reason I want the flat tip ones is so that I can rotate just a little bit, have that there, and then put a battery on top of it, and then another battery on top of that, and then an uh, a knife on top of that. Then I'm gonna do this, and it's probably not gonna work as good now because I've got solder in here, but I'm gonna try to slide it through. And you see my new problem I gotta deal with? Mm-hmm. It's gonna be a challenge, but I'm gonna be able to do this, okay? Because then when I'm done, I can just pull it back through, okay? So you guys see what's gonna happen? I'm gonna solder that right now, and it's gonna be golden, okay? So here we go, a little bit of flux. Flux yourself connection. That's the thanks I get for trying to do it the easy way. Okay, so we're gonna heat that connection up. We're gonna let that solder work. Now, the only good thing is, since we've already done this once, it is quite easy to rebuild this connection. We're just gonna let that bubbling subside. When the bubbling stops, then we can let go. Let that cool for just mere seconds before taking our 457 pounds of counterweight off. And then we can go ahead and inspect our work which does look okay actually believe it or not and obviously we're gonna have to let go of that dip it in the alcohol yeah it's probably a little bit toasty still but i'm just going to clean some of the residual flux off to get the uh, flux off of there i'm just using the q-tip and alcohol like before the only difference is in a second i'm going to ram this back through the the wrong way i'm going to just uh Pile drive it in the wrong direction. Okay, you ready, hon? Quiet. Sorry. Listen, I want to hear the snap. <laughs> oh, it's so good. All right, so there you have it. Okay. Three and a half days later. It wasn't quite that bad, guys. Now this heat shrink has been sort of pulverized a little bit from pulling on and tugging on it. So we're just gonna do this. And just heat it up again, and you'll notice that it will relax the heat shrink and make a nice looking, neat heat shrink. Looks a little bulgy. Okay, so there you have it, okay? A little bit of alcohol. Wipe any little black marks off, and you have a full-blown connection here that's full strength. And then you can walk over to your airplane, and you can say, okay, everything looks correct. The positive goes into the positive, the negative goes into the negative. You have the perfect purchase, and now you can use your XT60 connector. Without compromising the ability to use your IC5 connection, okay? So that was a lot of hoopla. The only thing I'm gonna show you on the other connector is that the same exact principle is true for EC5 and these. So as a result, that means I'm gonna build one side, I'll feed the wires through, and then they will snap into place, and then we'll do the other side. Knowing that we had enough length with the XT60, we should also have enough length um, except that these connectors have a little bit more depth. So it snaps to about here. So we're probably gonna have to start with the EC5 on this one. So we're not gonna bore you with that or bore ourselves with filming it. It's really not that exciting to build these adapters, but I just want you to know that it can be done. Um, I don't fancy myself a really great solderer. I'm not a horrible solderer, but I'm certainly not the best. I know a lot of you guys are way better than me, but you can do it. We'll be back with more assembly shortly.